the Gallant, Star Legend Book Three, written and narrated by J. J. Green, with help from Welsh language consultant Mike Paddock. Chapter One. Wright was in deep shit in more ways than one. His platoon had penetrated too deeply into an EAC-held district of Kingston, and now they were cut off from the rest of the Britannic Alliance forces. If they didn't fight their way out soon, they would all be killed. Almost as bad, Brigadier Colburn was furious with him. He'd given Corporal Taylor Ellis a compassionate discharge without following proper protocol, and from the way the brigadier had reacted, he might as well have sold the BA's Caribbean assault plans to Dwyer Orr. We are at war, the brigadier had thundered. You don't have the authority to give her a discharge. True, her connection with Arthur could make her vital to our plans. Also true. Now his snap decision, taken out of sympathy for Ellis's plight, could mean his court-martial, imprisonment, and even execution, after the alliance finished retaking Jamaica. An alarm blared, echoing from the surrounding buildings. All around him, in the factory where they'd taken refuge, the Marines instinctively ducked. He had guessed the same. It was an incoming alarm. They were about to be bombed by their own side. Great, Kingston's power had been out ever since they'd landed a week ago, but pulse fire from enemy troops broke the overwhelming darkness of a cloudy night. The EAC hadn't moved on their position yet. They were keeping them pinned down, though, maybe waiting for reinforcements. C Ram kicked into life, spurting salvos of tracer slugs, trails of smouldering sparks. The juddering report of their firing shook his teeth and bones. Where the slugs destroyed the alliance shells, explosions lit the sky like macabre fireworks. The industrial sector of the city, where armament manufacturing plants abounded, was inevitably hotly contested. The Crusaders' automatic defence systems had been triggered. Would their troops be withdrawn? Nice idea, but unlikely. Boom! The wall on the opposite side of the street exploded, spraying masonry into the air. A chunk of it crashed to the ground outside and shattered. Flames licked up in the bombed building, quickly growing brighter and taller. Wright's comm sprang to life. Sit, Rep Major," said Lieutenant General Cowell, the officer coordinating the Royal Marines' role in the offensive. Still pinned down, sir. Every attempt they'd made to leave had been met with heavy pulse fire. They were in a stinking situation, and that was before their own side started bombing them. Well, you'd better unpin yourselves," said the Lieutenant General. "The army are shelling the area." I'm aware of that, sir," Wright replied tersely. Another missile made it through the sea ram fire. The ground shuddered. They're aware of your presence," said Carroll. "But securing that section of the city is vital. They held off as long as they could. The latest report says EAC presence southwest of you is minimal. Try to get out that way. Check." Wright had more to say, but held his tongue. The previous report had stated the EAC had abandoned the industrial area. When they'd encountered resistance upon entering it, Carroll had told him to press on. It was only rearguard action, he'd said. Then the enemy had closed in behind them. He didn't place much faith in the reports. "You're on your own, Major," said Carroll. Unfortunately, no one has any spare capacity to help you. When you get out, go to the Prime Minister's palace. Understood, sir. Cowell closed the com. The Alliance's determination to win back Jamaica came easy when its military leaders were many kilometers distant. Cowell was safely tucked away aboard HMSS Gallant in high Earth orbit. 
Wright wondered if he would be so bullish if he were here, hunkered down while death dropped from the sky. He had no choice except to take the report at face value and attempt an exit to the southwest. We're leaving in two minutes, he told his platoon. He ran to the relevant outer doorway, crouching low, dodging bench legs, half-built armaments and production belts. A barrage of pulse fire was flashing at them. The EAC was redoubling its effort, predictably not trying to escape the shelling. Propping his shoulder against the door jam, he peeked out. They were in the centre of a disaster zone. Abandoned vehicles, upturned dumpsters and smashed up food stalls littered the streets, along with the occasional corpse. The avenue leading southwest was a straight line. They would be able to travel fast down it, but they would also be easy targets for every EAC soldier watching from the surrounding buildings. It would be like running down the target end of a shooting range. He gauged the intensity of enemy pulse fire coming from different locations and spied out what wreckage, recessed doorways and overhangs would provide cover. Splitting the platoon into teams, he gave detailed orders. Sergeant Elphick and Lance Corporal Patel would lead the teams that left first. The sergeant had been with him through many campaigns. Patel was new to her position, but she'd proven herself competent and trustworthy, if a little too eager. He ordered all who could be spared from defending the factory to assemble at the exit. Elphick's group began laying down cover. Wright sped with his marines toward an overturned truck. Their movement provoked a volley of shots from the enemy, despite the efforts of the covering team. They made it to the truck. Nestling his back against the truck's axle, he gave the signal. Patel's group burst out and sprinted for a dumpster farther down the street, while Wright sprayed fire at the hidden EAC troops. It was time for Elphick to leave. His team had the farthest to go. A bus shelter had miraculously survived the fighting unscathed. The metal shell wouldn't withstand solid rounds, but the enemy had stuck to pulse fire so far. Wright gave the order and the sergeant took his turn at being a moving target along with his men and women. Patel's group helped provide cover and the next team made ready to leave the factory. And so the retreat began, each set of marines leapfrogging another, gradually making their way down the street. Meanwhile, the shelling had continued. The EAC's sea ram was effective about three quarters of the time. The final quarter of BA missiles was getting through, gradually turning the industrial district to burning rubble. The last team left the factory and raced to the dumpster where Patel's group had briefly sheltered a few minutes before. Now it was Wright's turn. We're moving, he said to his team. Stay tight, stay tight and low. Firing rearward at the enemy closing in on the now deserted factory, he and his marines left the truck and sprinted for the bus shelter, which was now little more than a smoking ruin. Streams of tracer fire lanced across the sky. A missile screamed overhead and flew into an upper story window, exploding and blowing off the building's roof. Burning confetti showered down. Sir, came Patel's voice through his comm. What is it, Lance Corporal? There's a barricade across the street. They've cut off our escape route. He silently cursed. How many hostiles? Hard to tell. Not more than fifteen, I guess. We experienced less fire the farther we went, but now we're stuck. So there had been some truth to the report. He synced with Patel's vid feed. Blocking the street in front of her, turned side on, were an armoured personnel carrier, two jeeps and an ice cream van. All were piled high with debris from the streets, weighing them down. The ice cream van stood in the centre of the barricade, sporting the slogan, the creamiest ice in Jamaica, and, underneath, stop me and buy one. 
emblazoned over the van signage in massive letters was a single word of graffiti. Resist. The window was closed. There would be no iced treats for anyone today. Do you have any survey drones left? Er, uh, five, sir. Send them over the barricade. Her vid feed shifted as she complied. The marble-sized drones activated and connected with his suit system. Their visual and scan data amalgamated and played on his HUD, displaying the line of vehicles growing closer and then moving below. They reached the other side of the barricade. Eight EAC soldiers were near it and four or five more crouched in doorways. Then the display flashed red and cut out. The Crusaders had an anti-drone device. It was to be expected. But the brief view he'd had of their setup was sufficient. It was time for his team to leapfrog to their next position. They moved, attracting heavy fire. The troops to the rear were closer and becoming bolder. He thought about the barricade. If he delayed too long, his entire platoon would be caught against the barrier, sitting ducks. He made his decision. He would prefer to be there for the attempt, but he had no choice. Wait for Sergeant Elphick to arrive, Patel, then try to break through. Keep me updated. Yes, sir. He calmed Elphick. He hoped Patel and the sergeant could do it. To the rest of the platoon, he said, Double time, Marines. We have business ahead. Colburn's wrath seemed a better alternative to what lay in store. Chapter 2 Talon peered through binoculars over the rounded summit of a low hill in West B.I. The grass beneath her was long, cold and wet. She'd been lying in the same spot for hours. It was nearing midday and she hadn't seen anything noteworthy. Though her waterproofs mostly protected her, rough blades poked in at her neck and ankles, chafing her exposed skin, and the chill from the ground had seeped into her bones. From the numerous piles of crumbling sheep shit, she guessed the hill had once been used for grazing, but judging by the length of the grass, no sheep had been here for a while. Had the Crusaders eaten them? Doing something so stupid and destructive would be right up their alley. They must have closed down the meat culturing factories, or they were too dense to operate them. Sheep were for shearing, not eating. Idiots. In this case, the EAC's stupidity was to her advantage. The tall grass provided excellent cover while she spied on the orphanage. The grey stain on the verdant landscape sat about a kilometre away, gouged from the bottom of the valley. A narrow road snaked toward it, ending at the gates. Within the perimeter fence sat ten prefabricated blocks with flat asphalt roofs. The windows of nine of the blocks were curtainless, and through them rows of child-sized bunk beds, tables, desks and chairs could be seen. The tenth block appeared to be for the staff. Vertical blinds concealed the interior. A high chain-link fence topped with razor wire enclosed the site, regularly patrolled by armed guards. Not a blade of grass or any other green thing grew within the space. Outdoor play areas for the children were entirely absent. What a place for kids to grow up. It was more like a prison camp than an orphanage. But then, it wasn't really an orphanage because not all the kids were orphans. At least a few of the children's parents were probably still alive. Like her, their children had been lost or torn from them in the aftermath of the invasion, when the rush of refugees trying to leave the island had turned into a rout. Now most of the Britannic Isles digital data had been destroyed by the EAC, parents had to rely on legwork and word of mouth to find their kids. That was how she'd heard about the orphanage, and Harrod, 
leader of the West BI resistance, had put out feelers as soon as Talon had told her of her predicament. Poor Ang Harrod had died, but word had arrived of two kids who fit the description of her own at the orphanage. Talon rubbed her eyes with a finger and thumb. Nothing had stirred within the orphanage for ages. She placed the binoculars carefully on the ground, turned onto her back and stared at the sky. Clouds were scudding past, dark and gravid with rain. A cool, humid wind was blowing, carrying the lingering odour of sheep as well as the faint scent of wildflowers. It was good to be home. It would be even better if her home wasn't infested with cockroaches. Light raindrops began to fall, dampening her face. She rubbed her eyes again. Sleeping rough for two weeks had left her tired from the moment she woke up. And she was hungry. The West BI resistance had given her rations, along with the binoculars and other equipment she felt quite guilty accepting, considering such items were in short supply, but her food had nearly run out. She had to find Kayla and Patrin soon, before she was forced to steal to survive. In the current situation, she had no ethical qualms about stealing, but if she was caught, she would end up dead sooner or later. Preferably sooner. Dwyer Orr knew who had shot her in Jamaica, and now she was after her blood. The Dwyer would not dispense death quickly to Talon Ellis. The rain grew heavier. She'd been watching the orphanage for three days without a glimpse of either of her children. In all her hours of scrutiny, she'd only seen the captive kids 30 or 40 minutes in total. They rarely left their dorms, and when they did, it was only in order to walk to another block. Dressed in a uniform of dark jacket and pants, the kids walked with their heads bowed. What did they do all day? Undergo indoctrination, Talon answered herself. Even crusaders weren't sufficiently depraved to murder children. Instead, they lied to them and misled them, twisting their minds, turning them into true believers who forgot about their parents and their past lives. Had Kayla and Patrin already forgotten about her? She drew in a deep breath. A tinny sound came to her ears, like the distant noise of a door opening. She spun onto her front. The binoculars contained a directional mic, and when she'd put them down, she'd pointed them at the orphanage. One of the doors in the staff block was ajar, and a man and woman were about to descend the wooden steps. Talon centred the mic on them. I hope my transfer comes through soon, said the man. I'm sick of this place. I hate teaching those whiny brats. The woman quietly shushed him. They didn't speak again until they were several metres distant from the block. You should be more careful, she said. What if someone heard you? You know what they're like. Yeah, and that's another reason I want to transfer. They're watching us as much as we're watching the kids. They have to be sure we're teaching them the right stuff in the right way. It's confusing for children to go from one system of beliefs and thoughts to another. They're being careful we don't slip up. Stop making excuses for them. You're as bad as they are. I just understand their point of view. I'm glad someone does, the man said sarcastically. They had nearly reached another block. Talon chewed her lip. The pair's conversation was useless to her. Couldn't they at least mention a couple of names? Did they even know the kids' names? Maybe they gave them new ones. As the couple reached a corner, the man grabbed the woman's elbow and pulled her around it, out of general sight. He said something, but the mic didn't pick it up. Talon cursed and quickly adjusted it. Even so... After refocusing on the couple, she only barely made out what was said next. 
I don't see what there is to be afraid of, the woman said. You know as well as I do we're a prime target for insurgents. People will do a lot to get their kids back. Then it's fortunate for us all their parents are dead. Don't be naive. Plenty of them are still hiding out in the hills. All right, maybe there are a few. But the patrols will get them all eventually. No one would dare to attack us. Patrols? I'm not so sure. The sooner I get out of this place, the better. Good for you. Now let's go in, or they'll be wondering where we've got to. Talon had been careful since leaving the resistance hideout, always travelling at night and keeping out of sight. She hadn't seen anyone else in the lonely landscape, but her eavesdropping had confirmed the EAC did have people scouring the hills for natives they hadn't managed to kill yet. She'd been lucky so far. It was even more reason to locate her kids and get them to safety quickly. Lifting the binoculars, she scanned the hills on the other side of the valley. The high, grassy mounds were empty of life except for birds and the odd rabbit. In her current position, it was harder to see what was happening on her side, but she appeared to be alone. The view trembled and she realised she was shivering. It was time to move around a bit and get her circulation going. After another glance at the landscape, she rose to a crouch and then began to edge backward down the slope. When she was lower than her own height to the ridge, she rose to her feet but remained bent down low as she made her way toward the wood where she'd spent the last two nights. The hill ran down to a stone wall, one of many turning the fields into a giant chessboard. The wood covered the low ground too wet for grazing and straggled up the hills on each side. She'd stashed her belongings within the roots of a willow. She reached the outer trees. Halting, she looked behind her and to each side. Nothing moved in the landscape except crows riding the wind. She waded through the trackless bracken until she reached her campsite. Her sleeping bag and backpack hadn't changed position since she'd left them. Pulling a ration bar from her pack, she sat down to eat it. Regrets over her recent past ran through her head. Joining the Marines had been a terrible mistake. How could she have given up looking for her kids so easily? But she'd been messed up blaming herself for giving Kayla and Patrin over to someone else's care. It was no wonder she'd made only one friend and many enemies among her fellow Marines. They hadn't liked her beating them all the time in basic, but her attitude had sucked too. Never mind. She couldn't take back the past, and at least now she was finally back on track. She popped the last of the bar into her mouth. It was time to head back up the slope and continue her vigil, but tiredness dogged her. It probably wouldn't hurt to take a nap. The kids in the orphanage would all be eating lunch. She sat down on the leaf mould and pulled her sleeping bag over her rather than climbing into it. That way she wouldn't get too comfortable and sleep too long. An unknown amount of time later, a loud rustling woke her. Her muscles rigid, she listened. It sounded like two or three people striding through the undergrowth. The sound of their passage was accompanied by wax, as if they were hacking at vegetation with knives or sticks. The noises were growing louder. She opened her eyes. The dappled light had grown soft. She guessed she must have slept a couple of hours. About twenty metres away, three figures strode through the waist-high bracken, heading toward her. Very slowly, she slid out from under her sleeping bag. Something moved over there, a voice yelled. Can you see it? Shit! Talon bolted. Chapter 3 they were trapped. 
Two bodies lay on the ash fort in front of the barricade. Another marine was injured, mortally, according to his stats. Wright had called a halt to the attack as soon as he'd arrived at the barrier and seen how hopeless it was. Though they outnumbered the troops on the other side, they couldn't attempt to move the vehicles or climb over them without exposing themselves to enemy fire. And he had nothing except his men and women to throw at the problem. Weapons-wise, they were down to pulse rifles only. With nothing heavier, they were never going to break through the blockade, and they were barely holding off the EAC approaching from the rear. Lieutenant General Cowell had made it clear no one could be spared to come to their rescue. They had to make it out by themselves or not at all. Wright had been in tight spots before, but none as tight as this. Recessed shop doorways and abandoned vehicles were providing the bare minimum of cover for now. At least the shelling had stopped. The cessation in friendly fire was buying his platoon some respite, but it would also give their attackers more freedom to finish them off. The only possible escape lay in entering the buildings and hoping to find alternative exits leading into surrounding alleys and streets. One of the buildings was a large, well-known department store. It had to have a rear entrance for deliveries. But that could mean splitting up, with every marine for themselves, in an area alive with hostiles. It was likely they would be rounded up one by one, and everyone knew the EAC took no prisoners. He filed the option at the back of his mind to be used as a last resort. If there was a way they could stick together... Pulse fire flashed in the darkness behind. The second half of the trap was closing. His gaze fell upon a manhole cover. Why try to go through the barricade when they could go under it? Sergeant Alphick, I want you to go down into the sewer and try to find a route out of this mess. Take three marines with you. Wright shared his vid feed so the sergeant could see what he meant. Strictly speaking, the man would be going into a mess. A pause. Roger Wilco. Wright ordered the rest of the platoon to lay down cover forward and to the rear. The sewer would follow the street. All Elphick had to do was find a place where it was safe to leave it. Wright watched as he ran for the manhole, hefted it to one side and slipped into the hole, quickly followed by his team. Enemy fire from behind was intensifying. The EAC on the far side of the barricade seemed content to let their buddies take the majority of the risk, shooting only sporadically from their secure position. Wright diverted five marines to the rear defence. He'd lost contact with Elphick as soon as he'd disappeared underground. He wouldn't see him or his team again on his HUD until they surfaced. One of the dots that signified the members of his platoon turned blue. It was the man who had been wounded in the assault on the barricade. Wright silently cursed. This was like death by a thousand cuts. A minute dragged past. He decided to update Carol. After giving his brief report, he asked, What's happening in the rest of the city, sir? You're still on your own, I'm afraid, Major but hopefully your plan will succeed. Remember, the Prime Minister's Palace. Carol cut the comm. The Prime Minister's Palace sounded like a far-off dream. What had happened to Elphick? A Marine leapt from the open manhole, quickly followed by another. EAC on our tails, the first to emerge yelled. He grabbed the cover and thrust it over the hole. Wait, said Wright. What about Elphick? Dead, sir. The other marine was dragging a dumpster toward the manhole. Elphick and Moss, the man added. We were spotted as soon as we climbed out. The second marine had pulled the heavy dumpster on top of the cover. A sudden grief hit right. He'd known Elphick for years. They hadn't been close, but... He pushed his feelings aside. There would be time to think about Elphick later. 
His plan had failed and cost two lives, and he'd given the EAC another avenue of attack from below. From below. If they couldn't go under the street, he looked upward. The buildings all adjoined one another. Could they simply cross from one roof to the next? Now the shelling had stopped, the idea wasn't completely crazy. Lance Corporal Patel was sheltering in the recessed doorway of the department store. Wright explained his idea, planning on sending her to scout out the route to the roof and report whether an escape that way was feasible. Then he changed his mind. He'd already lost one good officer. This time he would go along and calm the rest of the platoon to follow when he knew it was safe. Don't go in yet, he said. I'm coming with you. After calming the Marines to continue to defend against the rearward attack and await further orders, he dashed across the street. Why is your visor open? he asked Patel when he saw her young face. I took a hit on it, sir. Couldn't see a thing. Wright was glad he'd picked her to help him find an exit over the rooftop. Operating without the benefit of a HUD was like fighting with one hand behind your back. Come with me, he said to her, and the two marines sheltering with her, Bates and Snowden. The store's doors were locked, but the glass had been smashed by looters. He stepped over the door frame and into the shadowy interior. Empty shop shelves filled most of the space and discarded broken goods covered the floor. Useless things, like bottles of perfume, cosmetics, costume jewellery and swimwear. They ran for the escalator and bounded up the frozen steps. A turn and another set of escalators. Another turn and another run upward. Five more floors later, they came to the final escalator, which ended in an amusement centre. The machines were silent and dark. The four marines' helmet lights swept the place as each looked for a route onto the roof. I think I see an exit sign, said Patel. She set off across the room quickly, weaving between the sim globes and hollow cubicles. Slow down, Lance Corporal said Wright. I don't want us to get sep... It's here, sir, she exclaimed. Patel, yelled Wright. Wait! He dashed to catch up to her. At the same time, there was a clunk, like the sound of a heavy bar being pressed down, followed by the creak of hinges. Patel! Pulse fire spurted through the open door. Wright reached the Lance Corporal just in time to catch her in his arms as she fell backward. She'd been hit in the face through her open visor. He turned his head away from the sight. Another pulse bolt flew through the door, hitting Patel in the stomach. Her armour blackened and smoked, but she was already dead anyway. Bates threw himself at the door and slammed it shut. It locked automatically, only opening from the inside. Sir, said Snowden, we have to get out of here. Wright realised he'd frozen. Yes, I... He couldn't seem to let go of Patel. We'll have to leave her, Major, said Bates. The two Marines looked at each other. Snowden gently pulled Patel out of Wright's arms and laid her down. Sir, said Bates sharply, do we go back down to the street? The door resounded as something struck it. Yes, said Wright, his voice sounding like a stranger's. Back down to the street. Check, Snowden said. Let's go. His words triggered Wright into action. Bates leading, they ran for the head of the escalator and began bounding down it. Wright tried to think of something else to try when they reached the street, but his mind was playing a two-second vid on a loop. A door opening, pulse fire, Patel sinking into his arms, her ruined face. Chapter 4 
Talon's feet thudded through the long grass. Her panting and the whistle of the wind were loud in her ears. Her lungs, heart and muscles seemed to scream at her, begging her to stop, but she couldn't. Stopping was certain death. At first she'd run straight, putting as much distance between herself and the Crusaders as she could, hoping to crest a hill and dip out of sight before they emerged from the wood. Then a pulse round had hit the ground beside her, flaming the vegetation. So she'd begun to zigzag randomly, presenting a harder target. All the while the slope she was racing up appeared never-ending. She longed to reach the top, even though, realistically, it was unlikely she would escape then. But the respite of being temporarily out of sight would be welcome. Another round hit the grass, incinerating the exact spot where her foot had been a split second earlier. She realised she was running faster for the same amount of effort. The slope was levelling off. She was near the top of the hill. She risked a glimpse of what was happening behind her. Three figures were visible. Two men and a woman were toiling up the rise. Only one was armed. Ahead of her, the landscape opened out into wide pasture on the farther side of the hill. Not a road, wall, hedgerow or other hiding place was in sight. Her thumping heart plummeted into her stomach. Her only chance of survival was to outrun her pursuers and avoid being shot. If only she could magic herself to the size of a rabbit and disappear down a hole. Where was Merlin when you needed him? Taking advantage of the upward slope, she opened out her stride. The rough grass flew past beneath her, only the balls of her feet making contact with the ground. Briefly, she thought of everything she'd left behind. Binoculars, sleeping bag, food, water bottle, everything the West B.I. resistance had loaned her. If she managed to get away, she would have little more than the clothes she wore. She would have to give up searching for Kayla and Patrin, temporarily at least. Damn the Crusaders! Damn them for making her lose her children! Damn them for all the people they'd killed! A sudden agony erupted at the back of her right thigh and she caught a whiff of an acrid scent, the odour of her own seared flesh. She'd been hit. The ground and sky became a whirling, spinning confusion. Her hips and shoulders were buffeted by bumps and grass whipped her face over and over as she rolled down the slope. When she stopped, with no place to crawl and hide, her pursuers would catch up to her in seconds. And then what? She remembered Wilson, horrifically tortured by Dwyer Orr, displayed for all to see at the ceremony intended to launch the invasion of Ireland. A quick death would be better. She was slowing down. She snatched at tussocks. They tore out of her hands, but she slowed herself a little more. Then she held on to one tussock so tightly her motion didn't jerk it from her hand. She stopped. Her right leg was a throbbing mess of pain, utterly useless. Even if she hadn't been surrounded by open countryside, she couldn't have got away. Grimly, she awaited her hunters. One of the men was the first to reach her. Breathless, he slid to a halt on his knees and turned excitedly to his companions. She's here! You winged her, Stefan! He was wearing the crusader's strange garb, simple clothes that looked hand-woven and hand-sewn. Talon seized the man's shoulder, yanking it to pull herself closer. In one smooth movement, she pulled out her knife and thrust it under his ribs. She gave it a twist to make sure she cut something vital and then jerked the blade free. Blood gushed out, drowning her wrist. His mouth formed an O of surprise as she pushed him down and faced her two remaining attackers. They were not so foolhardy. The man aimed the rifle at her as he trotted down the slope. 
The woman ran a short distance behind him, her white-faced gaze on the expiring body at Talon's side. Both halted ten paces from her. Drop the knife, the crusader with the rifle ordered. She hesitated. A fast, certain death or agonising torture along with a tiny chance of escape. She tossed the knife. It sank blade downward into the soft soil. Should she tell them her name? It would guarantee her survival in the short term, but she still wasn't sure if she wanted to survive. Killing the first of her pursuers to reach her had been almost a reflex action. Before she could say anything, the man said to the woman, Is it her? What do you think? Had they seen a picture of her? Had Dwyer Orr managed to find one? Perhaps she'd created an image in the same way she'd created hollows of Kayla and Patrin, based on Wilson's memories of her vids. Except that hadn't been the Dwyer's work. Arthur had said another person was responsible, Morgan Le Fay. Could be, said the woman. She fits the description. The man glanced at the figure on the ground. And she's definitely a killer. The man she'd stabbed breathed his last. I'll hold the rifle while you tie her up, the woman said. Huh. The man gave her a knowing sidelong glance. Talon couldn't blame her for her reluctance. She wouldn't want to come near herself either. In answer to his companion's offer, the man lifted the rifle strap over his head and shoved the weapon into her hands. Approaching Talon, he said, No sudden moves, all right? He was pulling a rope from his pocket. She didn't answer. She never made promises she couldn't keep. Maybe we should just kill her, blurted the woman. The Dweer wants her alive, if it is her. We could say it was an accident. She fought back and... We'll get a better reward if she's alive, the man insisted. He was within two paces of Talon. They were having a staring competition. She was confident she would win. Just keep the rifle on her. The woman shifted on the spot, adjusting her aim. Stand up. Her thigh screaming its protest, she got to her feet, carefully adjusting her position to take account of her wound. Arms behind your back, said the man. Without her gaze leaving his, she obeyed. That's it, the man said, relieved. No need to make this harder than it has to be. He had reached her. I'm glad we agree, she said, stooping to take her other knife from her boot. She grabbed the man's hair, pushed the knife tip into the dip between his windpipe and neck muscle and jerked him in front of her. Lose the gun, she ordered. The woman's gaze flicked from the blade to Talon and then to the man's eyes. One hand full of his hair and her other around the knife hilt, Talon urged him forward and moved with him. As her right leg was forced to bear some of her weight, she ground her teeth. What? What should I do? the woman asked. Whatever you do, replied the man. Don't shoot. Should I? Lose it, Talon ordered. Another shove of the trembling man, another hop. The woman's expression hardened. She lifted the rifle higher and squinted through the viewfinder, probably imagining Talon was so close now she could take her out without harming the man. Wrong. Talon jabbed the knife. In and out, blood gushed from his neck. Giving him a final hefty push, she sent his dying body toward the female crusader. Her eyes popping in horror, the woman stumbled backward. Talon sprang forward on her good leg, knocked aside the rifle muzzle and threw herself on the woman. Another jab of the knife and the final crusader's lifeblood began spurting freely from her neck through clasping fingers. The pain of her wound overwhelming her, Talon collapsed. She waited. When the waves receded a little, she lifted her head. A quick survey of the landscape told her she was alone with the three bodies. But things might not stay the same for long. 
the dead crusaders could be members of a larger group. On the plus side, she pulled the blood-stained rifle away from the dead woman. She was armed, but her leg was bad and she had nothing more than a simple first aid kit stashed in her backpack a mile or more away in the wood. She crawled, favouring her good leg, to the knife she'd tossed away. After wiping both blades clean on the grass, she replaced them in their sheaths. It was time to start moving. Chapter 5 How old had Patel been? Twenty? Twenty-one? Wright guessed the EAC must have spotted his team entering the department store and anticipated where they were going. Patel hadn't stood a chance. If only she'd waited, been more cautious. But she was young, too young. He should have taken her over-eagerness into consideration and left her in the street with the others. It was his fault she'd died. Elphick had been married with a family at home in Australia. Had he put too much responsibility on his sergeant by asking him to find an underground escape route? Maybe he should have led the attempt himself. Maybe he should be dead, not Elphick. Crouching behind a dumpster, Wright wondered what to tell his platoon. He couldn't lie and tell them reinforcements were on their way, that all they had to do was hold out until their rescuers arrived. Unless... Opening a comm, he asked Lieutenant General Carroll, Sir, are any BA forces near our current position? Seconds passed as he waited for an answer. Negative, Major. Sit, Rep. Wright gave his report. There was a pause before Carol replied, I'm sorry, Major, if there was anything I could do. I understand, sir. He cut the comm. Gritting his teeth, Wright peeked out from the dumpster he was using as a cover. The EAC approaching from the rear had become bolder, and sniper fire from windows beyond the barricade was scoring plenty of near misses. It was only a matter of minutes before they were overwhelmed. After a short analysis of the facts, he told his surviving marines their next move, an all-out offensive on the barricade. It was going to be their final and only chance of survival. Swinging out from his cover, he joined the assault. The marines were running at full tilt toward the barrier. Pulse fire exploded from windows and the gaps between the vehicles. A stray bolt destroyed the facade of the ice cream truck, so all it read was Jamaica and stop. Someone was climbing up the side of a personnel carrier. As soon as he reached the top, a flash erupted on his breastplate and he crashed to the ground. But another marine was also climbing. As he clawed his way onto the roof, he was already firing. A third man joined him. A group had their shoulders against a jeep and were trying to push it out of the way, but distorted steel beams from destroyed buildings ran through it. The small gap they created was soon alive with pulse bolts. Wright scaled the other jeep one-handed, holding his rifle in the other. A chunk of masonry came loose and tumbled to the ground, nearly taking him with it. As he reached the top, he came face to face with a crusader. The muzzle of his rifle happened to be pointing in the right direction. Reflexively, his finger closed on the trigger and the pulse exploded on the crusader's visor. He disappeared. One for Patel. Scorching heat emanated from his neck and shoulder. He'd been hit. He looked up and caught a glimpse of a figure in a blown-out window. Aiming, he fired. The pain became too great and the hand he was holding on with opened involuntarily. He fell backward onto pavement. Despite the protection of his armour, the impact knocked the breath out of him. He struggled to suck air in. Above him, flashes lit the sky. He briefly thought the sea ram had started up, but its staccato report was absent. The flashes were pulse fire and... He managed to lift his head a little. 
They were coming from beyond the barricade. The EAC were fighting on ground they held. He turned on to his front and staggered to his feet. The number of downed marines had increased, but the overall number was fewer. Some had made it over the barricade. Perhaps that was the source of the pulse fire he could see. But it seemed too much for his platoon to account for it. He could barely move his left arm, but he decided to have another go at getting over the barricade. Before he could climb onto the jeep, however, someone began pulling down the debris piled on top of it. Someone on the other side. The Crusader snipers were still firing, but they were firing at their side of the street. As Wright watched, the sniper fire lessened. In another ten minutes, it was all over. The barricade was torn down, Wright's platoon helping. He watched, confused, the pain from his wound increasing as his adrenaline ebbed. The Crusaders had been neutralised by an unexpected, unknown ally. A mound of debris crashed to the ground and a jeep shifted position, opening up a gap. Major, someone calmed him. A marine beckoned toward the break in the barricade. The obstacle that had thwarted him for... How long? It had probably been no more than twenty or thirty minutes, though he felt like hours had passed. The obstacle had finally been overcome. But he didn't know how. Maybe Carroll had managed to organise a relief force after all. The windows in the buildings on the far side of the barrier were black and empty. The snipers were gone, probably dead. The cultists usually preferred to die rather than fall into enemy hands. He stepped through the gap. A man approached him, dressed in armour of a style Wright hadn't seen for a decade and carrying a similarly outdated rifle. The answer to his confusion popped into his mind. It was the resistance. The Jamaican resistance had come to their rescue. Wright raised his visor and held out his hand. I can't thank you enough. The man's hand remained by his side. He replied grimly, We don't want your thanks. We want you to leave our country. You aren't welcome here. Chapter 6 The fruit seller had a security bot. If you didn't approach the store from the front like an honest, regular customer, it would shoot you with a laser beam. The beam could penetrate cloth and burn skin. Carla knew this for a fact. She had the scars to prove it. But she was hungry. The fruit stall was one of the few places in the market that displayed its wares within easy grabbing distance. Things had been tough lately, even for people who had jobs and homes, an increasingly small minority, and the stall holder probably wanted to tempt customers to part with the meagre contents of their bank accounts. When food was a luxury, fruit came last on shopping lists. Carla wasn't fussy about what she stole to fill her belly, providing the security bot didn't get her. The device hung from the rear of the stall, a metal sphere dotted with small flat lenses and spikes that shot laser rays. The vendor was standing with his back to her, busy serving customers from the front. Her gaze moved from the security bot to a display of peaches, plump, pink, perfectly ripe. Her stomach growled. From among the general chattering of the shoppers, Two voices grew louder. Too late, Carla looked up. She was just in time to see a heavy-set woman in a dark overcoat before the woman collided with her. Carla's small body bounced off the large-framed lady, and as she fell, she cracked her knee on the curb. The impact tore her skin open. Blood dribbled from the cut. The woman had stumbled only a little, but she cursed and berated Carla for being in the way, though of course it was her own fault. She hadn't been looking where she was going. 
she'd been too deep in conversation with her tall, wispy-haired friend. Carla lifted her upper lip in a snarl and spat into the muddy gutter. The heavy woman's friend grabbed her elbow and guided her away, complaining how the street rats were becoming a real problem nowadays. Carla pulled the sleeve of her dirty sweater over the heel of her hand and dabbed at her knee. The graze wasn't too bad, but dirt from the gutter had got into it. She would have to wash it and ask John the Apothecary for something to smear on it to stop an infection. He would help her. He was a soft touch. She returned her attention to the security bot. Was it watching her back? Probably. It would be programmed to detect suspicious behaviour, and her loitering would have alerted it. But it wouldn't fire unless she got too close. Her knee ached. Blood had broken out afresh and was cutting channels through the mud on her legs. Her stomach hurt too. Ah, mud! She looked from the patch of mud where she'd fallen to the glass camera lenses on the bot. Squatting down, she began to scoop up the gloopy dirt. If she had a good aim, she could. Carla, can you hear me? She paused and looked up and around. Shoppers passed by, uninterested in the little girl playing in the mud. Concluding she must be mistaken that she'd misheard a snatch of conversation, she dipped her hands into the mud again. Carla, it's Morgan. If you can hear me, try to say something in reply. She shot up. The mud oozed from between her fingers and dripped onto the wet pavement. Morgan, who the hell was Morgan? She looked around again. No one was paying any attention to her. Carla's head began to ache. The pain started behind her eyes, but quickly spread until it felt like someone had fastened her skull in a vice and was tightening it. She put her filthy hands to her temples and squeezed her eyes closed, trying to shut out the agony, but it only increased. Her brain was a fireball burning out through her orbits. She screamed. She opened her eyes upon darkness. The faintest of vibrations and quietest of hums nibbled at the edge of her consciousness. Where was the street market, the security bot, and the peaches? Where was the mud? And John, there was something significant she had forgotten about John. The pain was receding. She heard herself panting, but her breaths were growing longer and deeper. Understanding flowed into her mind, and the years between her childhood and now came flooding back. She was the leader of the Earth Awareness Crusade, and she was aboard the flagship of her space fleet, the Belladonna. Morgan was there too. The hated Morgan Le Fay she'd unwittingly released from captivity. As well as Perrin, she'd retreated to space, specifically Earth's son Lagrange Five, after the terrifying attempt on her life at the ceremony to launch the invasion of Ireland. As she sat up, her cabin lights came on. Wincing, she said, "Lights dim." She rubbed her temples. The threads of her dream were fading. But she found herself wishing John was aboard the ship. He might be able to give her something to help with the.、Uh... In her mind's eye, she saw an image: a pair of feet, one bare, old, and wrinkled, and one stuffed into a slipper, swinging in the breeze below a castle window. She shook her head, trying to shake away the painful picture. It was not her fault. If John had decided to take exception to her methods for governing her people, that was up to him. She wasn't responsible for his choices. It was not her problem that he hadn't understood. Yet, no matter what she told herself, the dull ache she'd felt since his suicide would not abate. Her hurt flashed into anger. Why had he done this to her?
He must have known how taking his own life would affect her. She had lost the only remaining contact with her past, the only person who knew her before she rose to power, the only person she could truly trust. Her only friend. He must have wanted her to blame herself, to make her look again at what she was doing with her life. Well, he wasn't going to reach out from beyond the grave and get his way. She refused to give him another thought. Nevertheless, fury stalked her while she got out of bed and pulled on her robe. After knotting the ties, she walked stiffly out into the passageway. Morgan's cabin was one minute's walk away, but Carla reached it in half the time. When the door didn't open immediately, she used her security override and stormed inside. What the hell was that? she demanded. Morgan was wearing a nightdress made of a fine, clinging material. She sat bent over an interface. Through the open doorway to the bedroom, Carla could see a man sleeping in her bed under ruffled, luxurious sheets, naked from the waist up. She scowled. Didn't Morgan understand it was a bad idea to sleep with the crew? She was inviting insubordination, friction, even mutiny. Morgan hadn't lifted her gaze from the interface. I thought you wanted to practice, she replied mildly. You said you wanted to practice. Not while I was asleep. You knew I was asleep and dreaming, didn't you? It was an accusation, not a question. Her shoulders rising slightly in a shrug, Morgan replied, I'm not sure what difference it makes. It makes all the difference. Ah! Carla pressed the heels of her hands into her eyes and sat on a sofa. God, my head hurts. Why didn't you tell me it would be so painful? Another shrug. I'm not sure how I could be expected to know that. I don't make a habit of teaching humans telepathy. When she finally looked at Carla, Morgan's eyes were narrowed and her features full of spite and peevishness. If you don't want to learn, tell me now. I won't tolerate your complaints while I'm trying to be helpful. Remember, you asked me to do this, not the other way around. Carla clenched her teeth and looked down. She had so much to say in reply, but she couldn't. She mustn't. Instead, she nursed her aching head. Moving to the comm panel next to the door, she requested medication from the sick bay. Folding her arms over her chest, she said, I suppose now I'm awake and here. It's a good time to discuss my next move to ensure my safety. Morgan's gaze had returned to her interface. I received a report that one of my search patrols in West B.I. had gone missing, Carla pushed on. They were found a day later, all murdered. They'd died from knife wounds, which makes me think it wasn't an organised B.I. resistance attack. They're better armed than that, unfortunately. I think Talon Ellis might have killed them. We know she didn't arrive in Ireland with the rest of the B.A. party. She has remained in West B.I. to look for her children, Morgan murmured. That's obvious. She straightened up and looked Carla in the eyes. She's dangerous, but she shouldn't be your focus. She isn't your greatest threat. She's a secondary character. Character? You make it sound like we're in a vid. As I've told you many times, Morgan went on, Arthur is the one you must focus on. Softly, she added, and I must focus on my enemy. Who was her enemy? Carla wasn't sure she dared to ask. But Talon Ellis is the one who hurt me. I want her dead. If Arthur had reached you with Excalibur, said Morgan, there wouldn't have been a thing I could do to stop him from killing you. Carla shivered and ran her hands up and down her upper arms. 
I should never have held the ceremony. It was far too risky. Hiding away isn't the answer. Your people want and need to see you. They must see you're unafraid before they'll follow you. Arthur was never afraid. When he was king, then and now. It's easy to be fearless when you're impervious to harm. Morgan lifted an eyebrow. And easy to be scared when you aren't. But Arthur isn't completely invulnerable. It would have been better if you had managed to kill him before the Alliance found him. The ship that picked Arthur up in Ireland took him to the Gallant, said Carla. He must still be aboard it. If I can destroy the ship, he'll die. In the bedroom, Morgan's evening entertainment was waking up. He rolled onto his back and stretched his arms out wide. When he sat up, Carla vaguely placed him as one of the cooks. Her nose wrinkling, she yelled, You! Get out! Morgan chuckled again, but she didn't object. The man instantly recognised his mistress's voice and quickly pulled on his pants. Grabbing his shirt and shoes, he moved out of the bedroom. Carla drew back with distaste as he passed her. Pain lanced her head again and she bit back a cry. Cradling her forehead, she winced as she looked at Morgan, expecting she was sending to her once more. But the voice that entered her mind wasn't a woman's. Mummy, Perrin said. Mummy, are you awake? Can you hear me? Morgan has been teaching me how to speak to people far away without com. Isn't it cool? Chapter 7 Low cots lined the walls and stood in rows across the floor of the vast ballroom in the former B.I. Ambassador's residence in Kingston. Each was occupied by an injured resistance fighter. While the Alliance had been assaulting one area of the city, the island's resistance had organised a coordinated attack on another area, squeezing the EAC between them. Wright surveyed the scene in the ballroom. Unlike the BA's field hospitals, this place seemed ill-equipped and poorly staffed. The man who had refused to shake hands with him, later grudgingly introducing himself as Devon, stopped a medic carrying a tray of bloody surgical instruments and told her they had eight Royal Marines in need of treatment. She did a double take looking from Devon to right and back, before pursing her lips with disapproval. However, she didn't protest, only nodded before continuing with her task. Devon's group had led the survivors in Wright's platoon through streets still boiling with skirmishes to this small quarter under resistance control. The fight for Kingston was a long way from over yet. Wright said... I can't tell you how much I appreciate. Devon cut him off with a swiftly upraised hand. This is only until your men are stabilised and you can reunite with your forces on the other side of the city. I understand and I'm grateful. He actually didn't understand, not fully. He'd thought they were both fighting on the same side. The man's frank animosity was puzzling but he didn't push it. For whatever reason, the resistance had rescued his platoon from a hopeless situation. Maybe they just hated the EAC a tad more than they hated the Alliance. I'll leave you to organise your troops, said Devon. You might find some empty rooms in the building where they can rest, but I can't help you with any supplies. We're low as it is. It's fine, said Wright. I get it. Maybe we can find something to do to help you. The resistance leader's expression remained impassive in response to the offer, as if he would believe it when he saw it. Without another word, he left. Wright's platoon was waiting in the marble-floored lobby of the building, among oil paintings of previous ambassadors, sliced, ripped and daubed with graffiti. 
He now ordered that his injured marines be brought into the ballroom. His men and women were all traumatised and tired after their long fight. They needed rest, but he wouldn't allow them more than an hour or two. They also needed to stay active. It would keep them from dwelling on the events of the devastating engagement they'd survived. There would be time for grief and nightmares when everything was over. The medic returned with two others to triage his injured, who had now appeared, carried or walking supported by other marines. After ordering the healthy remainder to find a spot where they wouldn't be in anyone's way, he replaced his helmet and went outside. It was time to take stock and make his report to Carol. He perched on a low wall at the bottom of the wide steps that led down to street level. The street was empty of life and the sun was rising on a city of smoke and ruddy haze. He brought up a list of the dead on his HUD. One fatality was too many, and here were Elphick, Patel and twelve more good men and women who had given their lives. Men and women? Most of them had barely lived. And he closed his eyes. He couldn't allow himself to dwell on the deaths. He calmed Carol. What are you doing, Major? the officer interrupted in the middle of Wright's update. I ordered you to join the rest of the troops regrouping at the Prime Minister's palace. We aren't able to reach it, sir. The EAC control the intervening territory. I see. Well, the resistance are helping us out. They rescued us and they've taken us to their field hospital. The resistance? We've been having problems coordinating with them. It's lucky they were in the right place to help you. Very lucky, sir. Sir, I think they're not entirely on board with the Alliance retaking Jamaica. You don't say. That doesn't make a lot of sense. Are you sure? What's the alternative? Do they want to remain living under the control of the EAC? From what I can tell, they seem to want independence. But I only spoke to one of their leaders briefly. Cowell hotly retorted, If they think they're going to win back Jamaica without our help, they're living in cloud cuckoo land. Maybe, sir, but we'll be damned if we're going to liberate them just to hand over valuable territory to their control. Sit tight, Major. I may need you to do some digging and find out more about their intentions. Cowell cut the comm. Wright wondered if he'd said too much. The Jamaicans would never win back their land without the Alliance's help. On the other hand, the BA's military was under the impression it was fighting for one of its own territories. If Devon represented the opinion of the majority of the resistance, the two forces had opposite aims. He could see the Jamaicans' viewpoint. If they wanted autonomy, they should have it. But it did seem kind of underhand to allow the Britannic Alliance to expend its people and arms on winning a war where they wouldn't benefit from it. He heaved a sigh. Let the higher-ups sort it out. He would focus on doing his job. The sun was a little higher, illuminating a scene of devastation. In his passage through the city, he didn't think he'd seen a single intact window near ground level. Looters or armed conflict had taken out everything for the first two or three stories. Scorches left by pulse rounds covered walls, abandoned, burned-out vehicles littered the streets, and bomb sites punctuated rows of buildings. Summoning the energy from an unknown place, Wright rose from the wall and wearily climbed the steps to the ambassador's residence. He wanted to find out how his injured were doing. He wasn't sure how long he could rely on the kindness of the resistance, given its feelings about the BA. As he was walking between two rows of cots, trying to find his marines, he spotted Devon. He was walking down the next row, talking to a white man. 
Both were using the local language. Wright halted in surprise. He recognised the man Devon was talking to, but he couldn't place him. It was odd that he should know him at all. This was only the second time he'd been in Jamaica, and the first time he'd also been on duty, attempting to assassinate Dwyer Orr. But Devon's companion didn't look like military. He scoured his brain for several moments before he made the connection. He hadn't seen the man in real life, but in vid news reports. He was looking at Hans Jonta, head of SIS. Jonta looked older and thinner than Wright remembered him. Grey thickly speckled his overgrown black hair and beard, and his features were lined and hollowed. His worn, stained clothes were also a far cry from the smart business suits government officials wore, but Wright was positive he was correct. What ordeals had the man endured? It must have been quite a feat to survive the Crusaders' invasion. Noticing he was being stared at, Jonta quit his conversation with Devon and came over. Major Wright? he asked. Yes, I... As soon as your injured are treated, be prepared to move on, Major. Taken aback, Wright didn't immediately reply. He'd expected Jonta to be relieved to make contact with someone from the BA military, but he appeared irritated. You have to understand, Jonta went on. Our resources are extremely stretched. It isn't in our interest to be helping allies whose aims aren't completely aligned with our own. Our resources? Our interest? Sorry, Wright replied, but I'm confused. Aren't you Hans Jonta? That's correct. Your confusion is understandable, but I no longer work for the BA government. I represent the Jamaican resistance now. Right, well, nothing would suit me better than to reunite with the rest of the BA forces. We'll be out of your hair just as soon as we can. Thanks. With that, Jonta left him. The former head of SIS was now working for the Jamaican resistance. Wright filed the fact under Not My Business and continued to search for his injured. He discovered one of them recovering from emergency surgery. The doc said the woman wouldn't be safe to move for at least a week. The other seven had less serious injuries and would be ambulatory with help in a couple of days. With the resistance holding the south of the city, the BA the north, and the EAC holding the sector in between, the platoon was stuck where it was for the time being anyway. He ordered his uninjured marines to make themselves useful to the resistance in whatever way they could, whether it was helping to move patients or supplies, finding sources of food or searching for the missing. He spent his time tending to the needs of his recovering men and women to ease the burden on the medical staff. By the third night in the hospital, Wright had almost forgotten about his strange encounter with Hans Jonta. He hadn't seen the man again, and his mind was focused on dealing with the current situation. Then, that evening, when he was outside in the ambassador's grounds, Jonta approached him. I hope you didn't mind me being rather brusque with you the other day, he said. You have to understand, my position here is delicate. Not a problem, Mr Jonta. Devon had already made it clear the resistance was only prepared to go so far to help us. I'll be moving the platoon on as soon as it's safe. I'm sure Devon would appreciate it. Um... He checked their surroundings. No one else was nearby. When you're finally face to face with your CO, Major, there's something I'd like you to do for me. Could you pass on a message? I'd prefer you didn't say anything over comm. You never know who might pick it up. Wright's eyebrows rose. 
Our encryption is tight, sir. Junta gave a half smile. Probably not as much as you think. The message is to be passed on to the new chiefs of staff. I want them to know I'm still alive and continuing the work of the Alliance in Jamaica. Wright's eyebrows rose higher. But you said, I said what was expedient in the situation. Devon could overhear us, you see. I have to be careful, but I am still loyal to the BA. I want the people in power to know that. I hope I don't need to spell it out, that this is to be kept strictly between us. Whatever you say, Mr Jonter, I'll pass on the message. Thank you. Chapter 8 Lorcan paced outside Iolani Hale's cabin, his hands clasped behind his back, waiting for her to emerge. She'd refused to return to the suite she'd been confined to when she first arrived on the Brez, so he'd given her another, one of the best. It had seemed only fair after his earlier treatment of her. Though he could be ruthless in his business dealings, resorting to kidnapping had been a moment of madness. He regretted his actions, most especially since the upshot had been he was forced to take her on as a consultant. Ever since the day when Kokoa had tried to help her escape and he had agreed to her proposal, he'd avoided her. The embarrassment and awkwardness were too raw. But the situation could not go on forever. He had to make use of her in the manner she dictated, sooner or later. His attitude toward the world-renowned zoologist had altered radically. Not so long ago, he'd wanted her to share her knowledge and advice with him. He'd sought her out to invite her to participate in the project, to help fulfil humanity's destiny of colonising the galaxy. Yet now she was here. The door slid open, revealing Hale dressed in the informal ship's uniform of pale grey tunic and slacks. Staff could wear whatever they wanted, but these clothes from the ship's printers were free to all, and most didn't bother wearing anything else. She tilted her head back to meet his gaze and, as always, he found her frank stare uncomfortable. Clearly it would be a very long time before she forgave or forgot what he'd done. I got your message, she said, and I replied, didn't you see it? There's no need for you to accompany me. I know my way around the ship very well. So you've settled in? he asked, deciding to overlook her slight rudeness. He'd thought he was being kind in escorting her to the meeting. I guess so. It isn't home and it never will be, but after a few weeks here I'm finally getting used to the place. I imagine it must feel very different from your home in the jungle. Life aboard a starship isn't for everyone. Some find it taxing. If it gets too much for you, don't forget you're free to visit the habitats at any time. The ones that are up and running, that is. Kokoa can tell you which they are. Thanks. I've already visited a few as part of my investigation into the project. I hope you found them up to standard. She gave him a look. She'd obviously found the habitats anything but up to standard. However... All she said was, let's save that conversation for the meeting, OK? Lorcan tensed his jaw, uncomfortable that she wouldn't tell him her findings immediately. If there was something important to know, he didn't want it sprung on him in front of his staff. Ms Hale, Ayalani is fine. We're going to be working closely together, so the less bullshit the better, Lorcan. I can't disagree with that, but what I wanted to say is... Ailani abruptly halted and her hand flew to her ear. Her features became suffused with joy. Yes, that's right. Thanks, I'll be right there. 
As if suddenly remembering she wasn't alone, she said to Lorcan, Sorry, a delivery I've been waiting for just arrived. I have to go to the shuttle bay. Can't it wait? Lorcan asked. But she was already trotting away from him and she didn't reply, though she must have heard him. He went after her, wondering what she was so excited about. The meeting couldn't start until she was there anyway. As he walked quickly in her wake, he conned the others to let them know about the delay. Had she ordered some scientific equipment? Her passion for her discipline was well known and would explain her sudden happiness. Only one of the Brez's passenger shuttle bays was currently operational, its capacity sufficient to cope with the movements of staff arriving and leaving the ship. When the prospective colonists began to arrive, six more would open to cope with the influx. Cargo shipments of construction materials formed the majority of arrivals, and they went to whichever landing dock was closest to the site where they were to be used. If Ayalani had ordered equipment, it had to be small and probably fragile to be shipped via a shuttle intended for personnel. Lorcan's interest was piqued. He'd long had a fascination for the intricate, complex machinery scientists used in their experiments. The light above the bay doors turned green and Ayalani rushed between them the second they began to draw apart. The snub-nosed, narrow-winged, 40-seater shuttle stood on its pad, clamps securing it. The hatch opened and the first of the passengers began descending the steps. Ailani broke from a trot to a run as she crossed the steel floor of the bay. Lorcan halted, puzzled. What could possibly be so important to the woman? Then it hit him. It wasn't equipment that had arrived, it was a person, her boyfriend, or maybe a family member had come to stay with her. He was a little put out, he hadn't been consulted about the unauthorised guest, but he couldn't begrudge her the company. As he knew too well, life aboard the Brez could be awfully lonely. It would make her stay more tolerable. He resumed walking. It wouldn't hurt to meet the newcomer and introduce himself. At the front of the shuttle, a smaller hatch for the pilot and crew opened. A bark rang out and echoed around the cavernous bay. He stopped again. Not a person. Ayalani's two massive dogs leapt from the crew hatch. They jumped directly to the bay floor, bypassing the steps entirely. Ayalani was 20 metres from them and they covered the distance in about four bounds. She wisely sank to her knees. The animals could easily topple the small woman in their enthusiasm and she was soon surrounded by a blur of ecstatic dogs' bodies. She rubbed their flanks and heads and nuzzled them, her face wet, either from their licks or her tears, or perhaps both. Lorcan watched his hands on his hips. His experience of the woman's pets had been terrifying, and he was not happy they were aboard his ship. If she'd asked him for permission to have them there, he would probably have said no, which, of course, was why she hadn't asked him. How had she discovered where they were being kept? The question provoked greater annoyance. Only a couple of trusted staff members knew which animal rescue centre in Suriname he'd tasked with collecting and caring for the animals. That meant that... Not only had Ayalani gone behind his back to order the shipping of her dogs, one of his employees had colluded with her. If there was one thing he despised among the people whose wages he paid, it was disloyalty. He had an uncomfortable feeling of control slipping from his grasp. Ayalani had questioned his morals and the scientific basis of the project. Now she was undermining his authority too. He sourly watched the joyful reunion, waiting for it to be over. Some moments later, she finally noticed him. Uh, sorry, 
She rose to her feet, calming her dogs with shushes and pats. I didn't know you were here, she went on. I'll take Darwin and Banks to my cabin. I won't be long. She stepped past him with the animals flanking her, their claws tapping on the metal. His glare followed. When he arrived at the meeting room, animated chatter was leaking through the doorway. He couldn't quite make out what was being said, but he could take a good guess. At his appearance, everyone became silent and deeply interested in the table's surface as he entered and sat down. Miss Hale will join us in a few minutes. Kakoa, Stedman and Jara were present, as well as Shao, the cryosuspension director, and Burke, whom Lorcan had recently promoted to head of security. He'd sacked the previous head after he let Hale escape. Had Burke been the one who told Iolani of the location of her dogs? He fixed his gaze on the man, but Burke had become fascinated with the grid covering the air circulation duct. Can I say, Stedman piped up, I didn't receive an agenda, just checking there isn't one. That's right, Lorcan replied. This meeting is to formally welcome Miss Hale to the team and to explore how she'll fit in as we go forward. Kakoa idly scrolled the interface embedded in the tabletop. She was the main person responsible for the situation with Hale. She had helped release the woman from her suite. If it hadn't been for Kakoa, Iolani would be safely in cryo by now, not sticking her nose into his business and interfering with his plans. He drummed his fingertips. Waiting for Hale was extremely irritating. The door opened and everyone looked up. Sorry I'm late. Iolani quickly slid into a seat. So glad you could finally make it, said Lorcan acidly. Welcome to the Antarctic project, Miss Hale. I'm sure we will have many happy and fulfilling days working with you. Kakoa softly coughed. Let's not waste time on introductions, he continued. Miss Hale's reputation precedes her, and I'm sure she has been aboard long enough for everyone to have made her acquaintance. As you probably know, she'll be acting as scientific adviser on various aspects of the project, wherever her expertise is most beneficial. Let's begin. From earlier conversations, I believe your first endeavour will be to work with Kokoa on assessing the habitats. He aimed his final comment at Iolani. No, she replied flatly. Addressing the room, she continued, I've spent the last few weeks looking at everything you're doing here. I can see the vast amount of planning and work that's gone on. So when I say what must be said... I don't want anyone here to take it as a slight on their professional abilities. I've been forced to come to the conclusion that the project is deeply flawed. It isn't your work, that's the problem. It's the concept. The premise of what you're attempting is wrong. She paused. Her comments were being met with blank stares. Lorcan was shocked too, but he was trying hard to control his rage. How dare she criticise the project? She was striking at the heart of everything he believed in, his life's work. And she knew it, the little viper. She was clearly out to get revenge for what he'd done to her. Have you quite finished? he said between his teeth. Lorcan, I've barely started. She folded her hands on her lap. In fact, it's hard to know where to begin. The idea that millions of people are paying huge sums of money to be taken on this fool's errand. She paused once more. I won't go on. It isn't helpful to be negative, and anyway, 
The project is too far advanced to cancel. The best I can offer is remedial action. We'll have to hope to God enough people survive for the colonization to not be a complete disaster. He had no words. You have identified, I think, three potential planets? She looked to Lorcan for confirmation, but he could only return her gaze, slack mouthed. Let me guess. Their gravities are close to Earth's, and the composition of their atmospheres is very similar too. Maybe you also have an idea about the land mass to ocean ratios. I don't know. The point I want to emphasize is none of that really matters. What everyone seems to be forgetting is that these planets are alien. They are not new Edens waiting for the blessing of humankind to descend and grace them with their presence. That's enough! Lorcan managed to finally spit out. Your implication of naivety is insulting. I don't know where you got your impression, but it isn't accurate. I apologise, Hale replied. I don't mean to cause offence but I'm trying to shock you into understanding just how unprepared you are. Let me give you an example. Have you considered how the human body will react to an entirely alien environment? It could easily be provoked into a profound and devastating immune reaction, even attempting to breathe the planet's air with its unfamiliar microbes, spores and dust could result in anaphylactic shock and death. She let this sink in, watching the stunned faces. Assuming by some miracle your colonists' immune systems don't go into overdrive immediately, you're going to have to hope they can eat the planet's organisms without a reaction. Why? Because the chance you can get Earth flora and fauna to grow there is practically zero. As I explained to Lorcan not so long ago when he came to see me in Suriname, the systems that support life here on Earth are incredibly complex. We scientists have only just begun to appreciate the fact, let alone understand the systems themselves. I would lay everything I own on the probability that anything you try to plant in an alien soil will die and any animal species you set free in the new environment will do the same. They won't stand a chance. Of course, you can grow things like tomatoes and lettuce with hydroponics, but staples like cereals? Forget it. You need friendly soil. Lorcan swallowed. Silence reigned. What can we do? Kakoa choked out. You said the project has gone too far to stop now. If we're going to kill millions of people, I don't want to be part of it. I understand, Ayolani replied. Neither do I. Yet here we both are. She turned to Lorcan. These are the two most significant flaws I've identified. There are many, many others, but they'll have to wait. We need to focus on these two first. On the plus side, I don't think they're insurmountable. If I did, I would have left already. There's a chance I can do something to help if I get some more experts on board. I have some contacts in human immunology I'd like to approach, there are treatments that suppress the immune system. They'll increase the likelihood of cancer, and if we use them, it would mean you absolutely cannot take any communicable diseases with you. As to the problem with establishing Earth species so the colonists have something safe to eat, the ethics and dangers of doing that on an alien planet aside, I have an idea how to solve it. The solution involves genetic engineering, something I can do myself, but I will need colleagues to work with. 
I have a few people in mind. I don't want to go through some massive rigmarole to get the people I need here. I have to have the freedom to operate independently on both these problems without interference. Do you agree? Lorcan held her gaze, wanting, needing something to say in retaliation to her challenge to his authority. But nothing came. Keep me updated on your progress, Miss Hale. He rose stiffly and stalked out of the meeting. Once he was safely alone in the passageway, he halted. The walls seemed to be flowing toward and away from him. He thought he might faint. He took deep breaths and waited for the dizziness to fade. When he thought he could walk without the danger of falling, he went straight to his suite and didn't emerge again that day. Chapter 9 Wrapped in her sleeping bag and ground sheet, Talon lay at the foot of an ancient oak. She alternated between shivering with cold and clutching her coverings around her, and then throwing them off when she grew unbearably hot. Her right thigh was a bundle of fire, her leg useless. She had taken the last of the antibiotics in her first aid kit days previously. The short course might have fixed an infected cut or even incipient pneumonia, but a large injury from a pulse round was beyond its scope. Her food had also run out days ago, but she had no appetite anyway. In a moment of clarity, she reached out to lift and shake her water bottle. It felt a quarter full. Feeling about with her fingertips, her hand alighted on the pack of steriliser tablets. All the blisters were empty. Another wave of shivering hit her and she shut her eyes. Her mind wandered. She was back on the hill near the orphanage, cutting the throats of the crusaders who had tried to capture her. Their blood still crusted her clothes. So much blood. So much death. She was with Patrin and Kayla in the pocket handkerchief of a garden outside their tiny terraced house. She was throwing a ball for Patrin to catch while Kayla made a daisy chain. The sun was hot on her back. She was in the West B.I. resistance hideout, preparing to leave. The members moved around her, shadowy in the half-darkness under the hill. They brought her items for her expedition, which she stowed in her backpack. The mood was sombre. One of the group came to speak to her. She cut him off. I know what you're going to say. The serious, guarded look on his face had said it all already. It doesn't matter, she continued. I have to do this. Talon, I'm begging you. Think again he urged. His name was Malo. He was the eldest of four brothers, all athletically built, pale-skinned, dark-haired and dark-eyed. Their kinship was evident to anyone who saw them together. And Harad's sons, they were among the founders of the resistance in that part of the B.I. We've only survived this long because we stick together, he said. If you go out there alone, who'll keep watch while you sleep? If you get in trouble, who'll help you fight off your attackers? I can look after myself, she replied. Probably better than you think. I'm sure that's true. It doesn't change the fact that it's dangerous to be out there on your own. If the Crusaders catch you... He didn't complete his sentence. Talon didn't need him to elaborate. She'd seen what Dwyer Orr had done to Wilson, and she didn't doubt Maylard had his own tales to tell about what had happened to resistance members who fell into the madwoman's hands. He was just looking out for her. She touched his shoulder. Maylard, until I find my own kids, I'll never be able to rest. I gave up the search once and it was torture. 
If I stop looking, how can I live with myself? Many of us have lost. If Ang Harad had been separated from you, do you think she would have given up trying to find you again? He nodded reluctantly. She wouldn't. I can't deny it. It was all that needed to be said. She continued to push items into her backpack. Lots of children went missing in the early days of the invasion, said Melo. A few were found. I hope you return soon with your kids. She gave him a tight-lipped smile. She certainly hoped to see him again too, but not without Kayla and Patrin by her side. In the hour before dawn the next day, while the others were all asleep, she'd slipped away. Though she'd only known the resistance fighters a short time, they felt like kin. Goodbyes would be too painful. Dragged back to the present by a wave of agony from her leg, Taylan reflected she would give a lot to see Melo again. She would also give a lot to see Wright. What was the earnest Major doing? Before she'd left the hideout, she'd heard the BA had launched a full-scale offensive in Jamaica. He was probably somewhere there, leading his Marines into battle. What an idiot she'd been to try to kiss him. Yet she didn't regret it. Underneath his rigid formality, he was a sweet guy. It was a shame she'd probably never see him again. A fresh surge of pain welled up in her thigh. She grimaced, squeezing her eyelids together tightly. As the wave passed, a voice sounded in her head. Corporal Ellis? This is Brigadier Colburn. What the f... Her implant! She was still carrying around the goddamned Royal Marines implant in her head. What do you want? She hissed. Surely it was dangerous for the Brigadier to calm her. The Crusaders might pick up the signal and figure out her location. The discharge you were given is invalid, Ellis. You're still serving as a Royal Marine. I want you to... No, Talon gasped. I'm not a bloody marine and I don't give a shit what you want me to do. She let fly a further string of expletives, finishing with, Stop coming me or you're going to get me killed. Silence. She lay rigid, outrage consuming her. Colburn had always been a bitch, but this was beyond the pale. Her fury bringing her to full consciousness, she took stock of her surroundings. Some hours seemed to have passed since she'd last been fully awake. Her most recent memory was of streaks of sunset colours filling the sky through the tree canopy. The colours had been replaced by twinkling pinpoints of light in a black void. How much longer did she have before the infection entered her blood and sepsis killed her? She guessed not much more than a day or so, if the process hadn't already begun. Two alternatives stood before her. Stay where she was and let death take her, or try to move. The latter choice was the less rosy. It would probably also end with dying, just more painfully. But, despite everything, she wasn't ready to let go of the thread of hope that she could find Kayla and Patrin. She unwrapped the ground sheet from around her shoulders and then pushed down her sleeping bag. The influx of cool night air on her body instantly set her off shivering again. Doing her best to ignore her discomfort, she slowly pulled herself into a sitting position and then packed only her most essential items. Panting and weeping with pain, she leaned to her right and grabbed the crutch she'd roughly crafted from a hazel branch. Using it as a prop along with the oak tree's trunk, she managed to get onto her good foot. She inserted the crutch under her armpit. Her right leg hung free as she brought the crutch forward. Leaning heavily on it, she hopped a step on her left leg. Another shift of the crutch, another hop. So far, so good. 
something about what she was doing, the night air on her face and infiltrating her clothes, the exercise or the short sleep, brought a sharpness to her mind she hadn't experienced for days. The surrounding woodland appeared clear and defined in the moonlight, and her ears were picking up minor nocturnal noises of animals moving through the undergrowth. Perhaps it was only that she was near death. She'd heard the dying often rallied in their final hours, feeling better than they had for days. Move the crutch. Hop. Move the crutch. Hop. Chapter 10 Move out, ordered Wright. After five days' wait, his platoon was finally leaving the resistance field hospital. An ambulance would be arriving at some point for the Marine who'd undergone surgery, but everyone else faced a three-kilometre walk across Kingston to the rendezvous point. From there, they would travel by shuttle to the Gallant. The battle for Jamaica was over to all intents and purposes. The Alliance had won, yet no one seemed overjoyed by the victory. As the Marines walked from the former ambassador's residence, their backs were bent and their rifles held loosely. Wright's morale was low too. So many had died, and not only in his own platoon. He'd heard the Alliance's losses had been heavy. And for what? During their time at the hospital, the Jamaicans had been cold and distant, barely tolerating the platoon's presence. It wasn't like he'd expected overwhelming gratitude, but, as far as he knew, none of the men or women under his command were from around here. They'd risked their lives and died in order to free a country not their own. He didn't think a little friendliness would have been too much to ask. He was not interested in politics or current affairs. he had decided long ago that the Alliance was a force for good and fighting in its military was morally right. After that, he'd been content to follow orders. So he didn't know what the Jamaican's beef with the Alliance was. Maybe it was justified. Still, it seemed unfair that the locals would take out their animosity on individuals who were trying to help them. On the other hand, Devon's group had saved the platoon from certain annihilation. The leader had also shown Wright a route across the city that would take them through the safest areas. The mopping up process was ongoing and pockets of crusaders were holding out, refusing to surrender. His marines were battle-weary and he didn't want to put them into any more conflict situations if he could avoid it. Carroll hadn't given him anywhere near such detailed intel. Despite his animosity, Wright trusted Devon's information more anyway. The Resistance's knowledge of the city and what was happening within it was intimate. Major Wright! It was Hans Jonter. He hadn't seen the former head of CIS since they'd met in the garden. Jonter descended the steps at the front of the residence. Wright waited, allowing the platoon to go on without him. When Jonta reached him, he looked over his shoulder before continuing, I just wanted to check. I know, said Wright. The message. I haven't forgotten. Good, thank you. I can't tell you how fortunate it's been for me that you happened to come here. It's been very difficult to... He struggled for the appropriate word. Play two sides, Wright offered. The former Alliance official looked somewhat embarrassed. I suppose you could put it like that, but it's for the greater good. Wright was tired, bone tired, too tired for the man's intrigues. Well, I'd better go. I hope whatever greater good it is you're aiming for, you get it. He began to move away. For the greater good of all, of course. Wright didn't answer. Safe journey, Major, Jonta called out. Wright wasn't stupid enough to imagine the man actually cared about his well-being. He only cared that he didn't die before passing on the message. 
But Jonta's words reminded him of someone else who had wished him a safe journey not so long ago, in a hollow in a hill in West B.I. He picked up his pace to catch up to his platoon and continued walking fast until he reached the front. They had a long boulevard to traverse, which would lead them into the city centre. From there they had to head east. The route wasn't the most direct, but Devon had warned them to steer clear of an area that housed a sports stadium. It was here the majority of Crusaders were concentrated, entirely surrounded by Alliance troops. Negotiations had been attempted, but met with silence. Should blow the whole lot of them up, Devon had said, disgusted. Wright could sympathise. He expected tales of execution sites and mass graves to come out soon. That was what had happened in every other place the EAC had invaded. He didn't see why Jamaica should be any different. Cowell calmed him. After the usual preliminaries, he said, I want you to make a short diversion. There are 17 soldiers in a bad way, about half a click from you. They're only just out of basic, have no officers with them, and several are injured. I want you to collect them and take them to the rendezvous. I'm sending coordinates. The numbers appeared on Wright's HUD. He mentally sighed. He didn't object to lending the army a hand, but the men and women in need of help were near the sports stadium Devon had advised him to avoid. Roger Wilco, he replied. See you for debriefing on the gallant in a couple of days, said Carroll, before closing the comm. Wright ordered his platoon to halt. He picked Bates, Snowden and three more uninjured marines to take with him and then told the rest of them to find somewhere safe to wait until he returned. The route to the soldiers took them through downtown Kingston. Like everywhere else he'd seen in the war-torn city, the place was devastated. Looters had ripped it apart and battles with the EAC had finished the job. The stadium rose above the skyline. Miraculously still intact, it was testament to modernity, its lines sleek and silver, glinting in the brilliant sunshine. The contrast with the ransacked, demolished, corrugated iron and wooden shacks of the poor sector they were walking through was stunning. Helis were circling the skies over the stadium, and Wright had no doubt the Alliance would be flooding the place with survey drones as they assessed the situation. He wondered how many Crusaders were holed up in there. They found the soldiers in the shadow of two huge shade trees in a square. Most had their backs propped against the trunks, some lay at full stretch on the dirt. There were a few half-hearted responses to the Marines' approach, but the men and women were clearly spent. What a baptism into military life they must have had, straight from basic into full-blown warfare. He guessed they were all barely adults too. The Alliance was becoming more and more desperate in its search for new recruits. He told the ones who had stood and saluted they were at ease and then began assessing the group. Distant sounds of voice amplifiers could be heard as the Alliance negotiators tried to talk the Crusaders into surrendering. He looked at the soldiers lying down while Bates and the other Marines chatted to the rest. Veterans of several battles, they knew the gentle banter that would help the teenagers heal psychologically from their experiences. He ran a medical scan on the first recumbent soldier. Private Kelly Mapple, fractured humerus, multiple hematomas, third degree burns to the stomach, low blood pressure but no internal bleeding, 91% chance of full recovery with medical treatment within the next eight hours. Are you able to walk, Mapple? he asked. Yes, sir, she replied. I, I think so. Good. He ordered Snowden to assist Private Mapple. He felt sick. The young woman reminded him of Patel. 
the Alliance docks would patch her up and send her back into battle, a lamb to the slaughter. Pushing through his misgivings, he moved to the next injured soldier. The sky lit up. Brighter even than the tropical sunlight, a flash had burst from the direction of the stadium. At the same moment, an explosion roared through the air. Wright didn't have time to order the soldiers and marines to take cover before the shock wave hit. Ripping the trees out of the ground, the wave blew him across the street and into a wall. His helmet saved his head from the worst of the impact and luckily he hadn't lifted his visor to talk to Mapple. The people in his care had been similarly tossed like rag dolls by the detonation. He lifted his gaze to the skyline. The stadium had disappeared, and in its place was a rising cloud of smoke and dust. What had happened? The Alliance would not have ordered an airstrike on the place, not while negotiations were being attempted, and it had so many personnel in the immediate area. The AP? The act seemed senseless. Ua Talman had little to gain by bombing the site and antagonising two forces that opposed him, and the resistance was unlikely to possess a weapon capable of inflicting that level of damage. That only left the EAC. The trapped crusaders had either blown themselves up rather than surrender, or the Dwyer had ordered the annihilation of her own troops. Both were possible. Wright looked around him, scanning the marines and soldiers. Several were unmoving. He opened his visor, turned onto his hands and knees, and vomited into the dust. Chapter 11 Carla leaned forward, propped her elbows on a table, and rested her forehead on her fingertips. She was sitting in the Belladonna's mess, facing Perrin. Everything seemed to be falling apart. Jamaica and Barbados were lost to her, two major Caribbean islands and thousands of military personnel. Reports from the other islands she held were either bad or missing. She suspected she'd lost more of her territory. Only the relevant military leaders were either dead or the situation was too chaotic to get information out. One thing she did know for sure. Faced with being taken prisoner by the Alliance, the troops trapped in Kingston had destroyed themselves. Their final message had reached her half an hour ago. It had been the right thing for them to do. Nevertheless, she felt their loss. Despite her exhortation to her people to reproduce, the numbers she could devote to warfare were decreasing every year. She was beset on all fronts, and she didn't know what to do. Should she divert the forces she'd massed in the BI to the Caribbean? It would take days for the majority of them to get there, and by then it would probably be too late. Should she press ahead with the invasion of Ireland, despite the damage the BI resistance had done to her military infrastructure? Or would her time be better spent focusing on the challenges she faced here aboard her flagship? It was between regular meal times, and the mess was nearly empty. She had brought Perrin here supposedly for cocoa, the chef could whip up a more delicious drink than that created by the food replicators, but in fact she hoped to avoid Morgan. The last place she would look for them would be somewhere frequented by the ship's crew, knowing Carla's distaste for over-familiarity with her inferiors. I want to go home, Perrin whined. Carla tutted. Though she loved him dearly, sometimes her son could be vexing. But she suppressed her irritation. As well as her military problems on the surface, she was fighting a personal war. It was a subtle battle for Perrin's affection. This one she was determined to win. Which home do you mean? she asked, reaching out to brush away a stray hair that hung over his eyes. 
We have so many. The last one by the harbour. I made a friend there, and I miss her. His lower lip jutted. I'm sure your friend will wait for you to come back. Carla replied. That isn't the point. I want to play with her. I don't have anyone to play with here. There are only grown-ups, and they aren't any fun. But there's so much else to do. Aren't you excited to be aboard a starship? No. He folded his arms across his chest. What if I ask one of the weapons officers to show you the particle ray? I don't want to see it. Or the chief engineer could show you the engines. Why would I be interested in engines? That's fair. I'm not interested in the engines either. She smiled. He frowned. Maybe it was time for the talk. Perrin, you're growing up so fast. It won't be long before you're a young man. Have you thought about what that means? I can have a girlfriend. Yes, you can have a girlfriend if that's what you want. You can have your pick. Any girl would consider herself lucky to be with you, but that isn't what I mean. You know I'm the crusade leader. As my son, you will have a role to play when you're a little older, an important role, second only to my own. And when I die, you'll take over from me. She paused, watching for his reaction. He didn't seem particularly impressed. Isn't that exciting? She asked. What will I be able to do? Anything you want, within reason. It's the perk of being the leader. So, if I wanted to go home right now, I could. Yes. But you would have to consider whether that was wise. It isn't in our best interests to return to Earth now. So, although we could, we aren't. Why isn't it in our best interests? At last, he was beginning to think things through. Because some people want to hurt us, it's safer if we remain on the ship for a while longer. Until the danger's over, you mean that man with the sword? Is he the one who wants to hurt us? Carla grimaced. Perrin had witnessed Arthur's murderous approach through the crowd on the quayside at the invasion launch ceremony. Yes, him, and a few others. We should kill them. We should, and we will, in time. Until then, we need to stay here. Do you understand? With some apparent reluctance, Perrin gave a short nod. He picked up his mug of cocoa and sipped. Carla was pleased. She hadn't expected the conversation to take the turn it had, but it had been for the best in the end. Perhaps she'd shielded her son too much from the reality of life leading the EAC. He was more mature than she'd thought. Compared to her other problems, it was a small win, but she was grateful for it nonetheless. Chapter Twelve. Jamaica had been won. Now, for Hans, the hard work began. As he prepared to leave the cave in the mountains for the last time, he hoped the Royal Marines Major he'd met could be relied upon to pass on his message. Support from the BA's military wing would be instrumental to his return to a position of influence. Ties between Sis and the Alliance's armed forces had been strong in the past. When Sis eventually rose from the ashes, they would be so again. But he couldn't risk approaching the new military heads directly. They were not the type of people one could approach unnoticed, and he was confident the resistance were observing him closely. Maria had warned him many Jamaicans would never overcome their distrust of the Bakra. He lifted the heavy, old-fashioned pulse rifle that had been his constant companion since the attack on the EAC headquarters. 
Would he ever need the weapon again? He hoped not, but the situation on the island remained chaotic. Crusader troops were still being hunted down and rounded up, though he guessed as the news of the resistance and BA victory spread, many would take their own lives. He surveyed the rest of his meagre belongings in the cave. Clothes, a blanket, water bottle, camping utensils and other items, all scrounged after being released from his cage, all dirty, old and worn. He didn't need these things. Why had he bothered to come here? Better everyday articles could be found among the wreckage in Kingston. So many of the city's inhabitants had been murdered. Though food was now scarce, it was awash with other goods, too many even for the looters to handle. Are you ready, Hans? Devon asked from the cave entrance where he stood waiting. I'll be there in a minute. The wide space was nearly empty of people. Members of the groups he'd lived with for weeks had mostly already departed, taking their most treasured possessions with them. He suddenly realised why he'd wanted to come back one last time. He walked to a small alcove under a jutting overhang. The belongings here were undisturbed. A blanket was folded neatly on top of a pillow. A few items of cloth were stacked in an orderly pile. He squatted down and opened a small backpack. Inside were personal things, a comb, a silver necklace, several photographs. He pulled one out and held it up to look at it more closely in the beam from his flashlight. It was an image of two sisters, their arms wrapped around each other's shoulders. They were standing in front of a run-down little house in the countryside, smiling at the camera, their smiles lazy but full of joy, full of love for each other. He looked more closely at the identical young women, but he couldn't tell them apart. He inhaled deeply and then exhaled in a sigh. Tucking the photo into his breast pocket, he looked into the pack again. He found small ceramic pots filled with lotions and oils. As he opened one, he recognised a medicinal, herbal odour. It was the ointment that had healed the sores he'd developed in his time in the bamboo cage. He put the pot down and picked up another. Sniffing the light oil it held, he was surprised as sudden tears flooded his eyes. His mind only caught up with the visceral, unconscious response a second later. It was the oil Maria had used in her hair. He would recognise the scent anywhere. Rationally, it made no sense he should grieve her so deeply. She had brought him to the resistance hideout knowing the terrible torture her people would inflict on him. His experience had left physical and psychological scars that would never disappear. Yet she had also saved his life. If she hadn't driven him away from his villa on the mountainside, the EAC would have caught him eventually. He would never have survived alone. He screwed the lid on the pot and slipped it into his other breast pocket. He also took the silver necklace. Devon had left, and so had everyone else. The cave was empty and silent. Scattered remains from the months the group had spent there were strewn carelessly over the floor. How long would the thing stay here, unwanted, undisturbed, forgotten? Heaving another sigh, he plodded out. Just beyond the entrance, he paused for a few moments to allow his eyes to adjust to the strong sunlight. Stragglers were leaving the clearing, walking along the path that led upward into the jungle. Devon waited for him on higher ground, next to Maria's car. The fire that had burned for many nights on the flat stone ground was smouldering. Some people had chosen to burn their belongings rather than abandon them. Devon had spied him and was looking impatient, standing with his hands on his hips. 
but Hans had one more thing to do. He searched under the cave overhang. There it is. In the shadows stood an open, empty bamboo cage, the canes lashed together with vines. Revulsion and dread had passed through Hans as he spotted it. He strode decisively over and snatched it up. Holding it overhead in both hands, he marched to the fire and threw it on top. The vines charred and smoky tendrils drifted up. Hurry up, Hans, Devon shouted. It's time to go. Still, he waited. The flames were too weak to take hold quickly on the tough bamboo. Hans swung his pulse rifle forward, took aim and fired. It was an hour's drive to Kingston. Charles, the Kingston resistance leader, was meeting them there, along with the leaders of other Jamaican resistance groups. Alliance techs were working on re-establishing the net and it was hoped that, by the time the meeting started, the leaders might be able to speak in real time with their counterparts on Barbados, Cayman, Martinique and St Lucia. The EAC had been defeated in all these islands, though on the other former BA islands the fighting was ongoing. As Devon drove along the dirt road through the forest, Hans considered his next steps. The phase he was entering would be particularly tricky. His goal of uniting the countries that had once belonged to the Britannic Alliance and transforming them into a globe-spanning republic remained a long way off. He had to retain the somewhat shaky trust and confidence the Caribbean resistance currently had in him, while at the same time resume his former importance within the BA government. The two objectives were perfectly opposed, making his task almost impossible. Waves of excitement and pleasure passed through him. He loved a challenge, and this was the challenge of his life. Sunlight glinted on a moving object on the road ahead. What's that? Devon exclaimed. He braked, bringing them to a crunching stop. Hans recognised the device. He'd seen them before on news reports covering disasters and wars. It stood about 30 centimetres tall, and was running toward them on eight or ten articulated legs, supporting a small lozenge-shaped body of smooth metal. It's a cadaver sniffer, he explained. The Alliance must have deployed them. The automated machine raced down the track. When it reached the car, it climbed over the hood. Its feet tapped on the metal. Without a change in pace, it mounted the windscreen, ran over the roof and down onto the trunk. After reaching the road again, it swerved right and disappeared into the vegetation. It's looking for bodies? asked Devon. That's right, Hans replied. When it finds one, it'll transmit the location to a database and then continue searching. Recovery teams will check out the sites later and collect remains for identification and burial or cremation. That's... Devon's nose wrinkled. Helpful, I guess. It's just one of the things the Alliance will do to aid Jamaica's recovery. Yeah, well, just as long as they don't get the wrong idea, things won't be going back to how they were. Has anyone actually told the BA yet? Hans asked. Do they have any reason to imagine things will be different now? Not exactly, Devon replied. Not yet. It's early days, but they must have an idea. We haven't been friendly with them. We need to get what we can out of them in payment for all they've done to Jamaica and the rest of the Caribbean over the years. Then we'll give them the bad news. Hans wondered how that would go down, but he didn't wonder for long. The BA would never accept the loss of such a vital territory, especially not one they fought so hard to win back. It would mean war. He glanced at Devon. 
The resistance fighters were brave, determined and patriotic, but they were ordinary men and women, not trained troops. They also lacked the BA's firepower. If they stood up against the Alliance, even in its weakened state, the conflict would be short and bloody. It would be a great pity to see two groups with essentially positive values slug it out with each other. What sort of timescale are we talking about? asked Hans. For delivering the bad news to the Alliance, I mean. Two or three months? We'll have to see how things go. The timing was insanely ambitious and deluded. The local infrastructure was in tatters and the Jamaicans didn't have the budget or professional capacity to repair all the damage within years, let alone months. It was also nowhere near enough time for him to get them to accept Alliance control. It had taken him more than a decade to whip up the discontent and dissent among the BA hierarchy sufficiently to trigger the coup. It's best to take these things carefully, he said. Small steps. The Caribbean shouldn't try to run before it can walk. I understand what you're saying, Devon replied. But people are impatient to be free. We've had centuries of living under foreign rule. Now we finally have our chance and we're going to take it. No more bowing to the Bakra. His head jerked slightly as he appeared to realise what he'd said. Oh, sorry. It's OK, Hans said warmly. I'm glad you don't see me the same way as before. It did please him, deeply. If Devon momentarily forgot he was a hated member of the former ruling class, so might other resistance leaders. That would make his job all the easier. Still, he went on, I would caution patience. I hear you, Hans. Others might not. A signal flashed up on the dashboard. Ah, great, said Devon. The net's back. He gave the car their destination, took his hands off the wheel and rested the back of his head on his laced fingers. The car smoothly took over its own steering. Good old Alliance, I'm gonna miss them, he laughed. But not enough to ask them to stay. Chapter 13 Taylan had died and gone to heaven. She knew this because Dad came to see her, and he was long dead. When she was twenty-five and pregnant with Patrin, he and Mam had gone out fishing and a sudden squall had overturned the little boat. Though they were wearing life jackets, by the time the Coast Guard found them, Mam had died of exposure. A year to the day later, Dad followed her. The death certificate listed a hemorrhagic stroke as the cause, but Taylan knew better. When he'd come home after the boating accident, the light had gone out of his eyes. He withdrew into himself. Not even the birth of his grandson could raise a genuine smile. It was then Taylan knew it was over for him. His body lived on, but his heart and soul had departed with Mam in the freezing, swollen sea that had taken her. Here in heaven, he was happy again, he would lean over her, his face full of love and concern, asking her how she felt. She felt... dreamy. Being dead wasn't at all like she'd imagined, and heaven was way darker than she'd anticipated. If that was where she'd gone, where was the sunlight and where were the angels? Whenever she'd thought about dying, which wasn't often, She'd guessed it was kind of the same as you'd been before you were born. You just didn't exist any more. But in fact, it was more like being in a constant state of having just woken up. Heaven seemed to be a deep pit lit by flickering lights where people who had gone before you paid occasional visits. She wondered where Mam was. She would have liked to see her too. 
but when she tried to ask, she couldn't speak. Maybe the ability would come back later. She also couldn't move, though she didn't really mind, not yet anyway. She was content to lie here and see Dad every now and again. Then, one day, Patrin turned up. No! Taylan didn't want to look at him, but when she did, she saw he was holding his sister's hand. Kayla! Patrin! My little ones! What happened to you? Is this why I couldn't find you? Because you'd gone ahead of me? She began to cry and tried to sit up. It was wrong. It wasn't fair that her children had died so young. They'd barely had a chance to live. They would never grow up, never fall in love, never become who they were meant to be. All because Dwyer Orr and the EAC had snatched everything away from them. Patrin was gone. He'd been replaced by Dad, who was leaning over her again, holding her shoulders. Calm down, he was saying. You'll hurt yourself. Stay still. He didn't seem to understand how wrong it was that his grandkids had lost their lives so young. She tried to push him away, but she was too weak. She opened her mouth to tell him to let go of her, that she wanted to see her children, but no sound came out. Gotta dose her up again, said Dad, to someone out of view. Go to sleep, Talon. You'll feel better soon. The next time she opened her eyes, things looked clearer. A low ceiling hung above her, bare dirt between spaced wooden planks. Plump white roots snaked across the soil, and in places their desiccated feathery tips protruded. It was a strange ceiling to find herself under. Talon stared at it for a while. She felt deeply placid and serene, as if nothing whatsoever could trouble her. Without much disturbance to her peace of mind, she remembered believing she was dead. Now it appeared that wasn't the case, unless somehow she'd been transferred to a different kind of heaven. Straining with effort, she managed to lift her head a couple of centimetres. Semi-darkness met her gaze. The planked ceiling was concave, curving down to meet the floor of the circular chamber. Figures slept at the edges, covered in blankets or inside sleeping bags. A single dim light hung down in the centre, and short-legged camping chairs surrounded a plastic sheet, taking up about a quarter of the room. A few men and women were sitting in the chairs. Another was moving items on a low table. She was back in the resistance hideout under the hill, though she had no recollection of getting here. She's awake, someone said. Good morning. You decided to return to the land of the living then? The person standing by the table had spoken, but he had his back to the light and Talon could only make out his silhouette. He strode to her side. Dark, shaggy hair hung over his face but she still recognised him. Melo, Ang Harad's son. I, she coughed, I thought I'd died. You very nearly did. Can I take a look at your leg? He moved the cover up her body and then lifted her foot and knee. His brows knit as he studied the back of her thigh. He gently prodded her wound, making her stiffen and gasp. Sorry. We had to wean you off the good stuff. Medical supplies are hard to come by. Your wound's looking better. I thought we might have to amputate, but we managed to save your leg. You're lucky. He covered her up again. Mailer's expression turned serious. You're doubly lucky, in fact. If Mark hadn't happened to stumble over you on his way back from a job, you would have died. Or worse, the EAC would have found you. I was trying to get back here. I must have collapsed. Where were you when you were shot? Near the orphanage. The orphanage you were investigating? 
It's a miracle you made it this far with a wound like that. How come the person who shot you didn't finish you off? I killed him, she swallowed. Killed them all, he frowned. The best crusader is a dead crusader, but you might have created problems for us. When they find the bodies, they'll begin scouring the area looking for you. It's going to make things more dangerous for us. I'm sorry. I didn't intend to make your lives harder. He nodded. I know. He paused, appearing to weigh up what he was about to say. I'm sorry you didn't find your children, Talon. But now you've seen the situation at first hand, I want you to think hard about what you're going to do next. Imagine if you had found your kids. Could you have broken them out of the orphanage by yourself? And if you could have got them out, what about the ones you left behind? Don't you think they deserve freedom too? A painful lump swelled in her throat. That isn't fair. Don't you think if I could help those children too, I would? I have to put my own family first. I'm just saying, the occupation has affected everyone. If we all act solo, only looking out for ourselves, we'll never rid this island of the EAC. The Dweer will win. He stood up. I'll get you something to eat and drink. You need to build up your strength. His words had sucked away all the relief and joy Talon had felt after waking from her delirium. She had been so happy to realise that seeing Dad, Kayla and Patrin had been a fiction of her fevered, drugged mind. Her children weren't dead, or at least they could still be alive. Mela didn't understand. Dwyer Orr knew what her children looked like. Talon wasn't the only one trying to find them. She tried to sit up, but her arms were too weak. How long had she been unconscious? As she relaxed and stared at the ceiling, Mailer's words continued to bite, and she thought about other things he'd mentioned, like how medical supplies were hard to come by, how much of their precious stores of antibiotics, painkillers and sedatives had been used to save her. A new face came into view, Mailer's youngest brother, Mark. In the brief time she'd known him, he'd always been the friendliest and most easygoing of the four siblings. He was smiling at her, his dark brown eyes twinkling. Glad you're back with us. It was touch and go for a while there. Mela said you found me and brought me here. You saved my life. I don't know how I'll ever... It's not a big deal, he said. No need to get all gushy. I'd do the same for any of us, and so would you. He sat on the stool and rested his forearms on the side of her bed. Did you find out if your kids are at the orphanage? I'm not sure, but I don't think they are. I watched the place for three days and didn't see them. What a shame. I'm sorry. Maybe they're at another one. There are twenty or so that we know of, dotted about. Most of them are in towns, though, which makes them harder to watch. I can find out their locations for you. I don't... What? I don't know if I should... She paused, unable to go on. Talon, what's wrong? She choked out. Mailer said I was being selfish, searching for my kids. He gave her a look of disbelief. I'm sure he didn't say that. Maybe you're still groggy from the drugs and misunderstood him. He didn't put it in those words, but it's what he meant. And he's right. I've used up your resources and time and done nothing to help the cause. But, Mark, it was because I wanted to help strangers that I lost them. If I hadn't handed them over to someone so I could help fight off the EAC, I would be with them today. I live with that decision every day, and every day it eats away at me. You don't know what might have happened if you hadn't handed them to someone else. If you hadn't helped fight the Crusaders, you might all have died. 
It could be that because you chose to fight, they're alive today. Talon was unconvinced. She suspected he was only trying to make her feel better. It isn't only that. The Dweer knows I was the one who shot her in Jamaica and she has a vendetta against me. She also knows what my kids look like. She wants them too and if she finds them before me, she'll use them to make me give myself up. Dweer Orr is aboard the Belladonna, Mark replied. I'm not saying that means you're safe, but considering all her resources, don't you think if she could find your children, she would have by now? I think they must be somewhere she can't get at them, which means they aren't in a crusader orphanage. The Dweer still hasn't returned to her castle? Talon was relieved. She told Major Wright she might be able to spy on her for the Alliance, but so far all she had done was try to find Kayla and Patrin. There's been no sight or sound of her or her weird new companion ever since the launch ceremony. Talon, you have to do what you feel is best. No one here begrudges you anything, if that's what you're worried about. We all know what it's like to lose family. You have to do what you feel is best. Mark's words reminded her of what Arthur had said when he learned of her plan to desert from the Royal Marines. You must do whatever you feel is right and just. What was the right thing to do? Maylard appeared at Mark's side. It's just crackers and water, he said. But I think that's probably all you can manage for now. Don't you have better things to do than bother our patient? He asked his brother. I'm providing witty conversation to aid her recovery. Witty conversation? You, that'll be the day. Mark winked at Talon before leaving them. I... I thought about what you said, Talon told Mailer. She swallowed hard. What she was about to say hurt her almost more than she could bear. When I'm better and up and about again, I'm going to do what I can to help the resistance, for a while at least. I'm not giving up on my kids. I'm going to carry on trying to find out what happened to them. But in the meantime, I'm yours. I'm glad to hear it. I'm sure we can use you. Chapter 14 the instant Wright stepped off the shuttle, Colburn calmed him, wondering if she'd been watching a vidlink of the Gallant's Bay, waiting to see him disembark, he replied, Yes, Brigadier, my office in two minutes, Major. He winced at her harsh tone. Granted, she rarely softened it, but she had been known to on occasion for him. Older officers had told him he'd been as close as anyone had ever come to being a favourite of hers. Now, since giving Ellis a compassionate discharge, all favouritism was out the window. He'd morphed into Colburn's enemy number one. He'd put her in an embarrassing, tricky situation by giving Ellis a discharge when he didn't have the authority. Neither did she and she'd been forced to explain his actions to her CO. Though Wright didn't think embarrassment was the brigadier's problem, her life philosophy was based on following the rules, and he had flagrantly broken them. Maybe she'd thought he was the same as her, but she'd had a rude awakening. His version of the book included a human element she had disregarded. Squaring his shoulders, he set off through the unfamiliar ship. He'd only spent a brief time aboard the Gallant before joining the counter-offensive in Jamaica and hadn't had time to learn her layout, though the Alliance's ships were all roughly the same. The battle cruiser was a fairly new addition to the fleet. She'd been held back from the attack on the Brez, though he wasn't sure why. It had been a lucky decision in the end because the Gallant's long-range scanners had picked up the Fearless out in the asteroid belt. 
Now both the fearless and the valiant were out of commission, undergoing repairs, and the space fleet bigwigs had picked the gallant as their centre of operations. Payne lanced from his knee. He grimaced, stopped, and took a breather. His old wound had been bothering him all the time he'd been in Jamaica, and he'd run out of pain-killing meds. For years he'd put off getting the surgery that would fix it. There had always seemed to be something urgent and important that required his attention. Now things were more hectic than ever. He guessed the surgery would have to wait until he retired, assuming he made it that far. Colburn's office door opened on an unexpected scene. Arthur and Merlin were sitting side by side across from Colburn behind her desk. The two of them turned to him. Arthur smiled. Merlin's expression was enigmatic, as always. Stop gawping and take a seat, Major, the brigadier snapped. We don't have all day. Congratulations on your victory, said Arthur, as Wright limped to one of two empty seats in the row of four. I heard the battle was hard fought. Thanks, but I'm not responsible for the liberation of Jamaica. Not on your own, maybe, but I'm sure you fought valiantly. Can we save the standing ovation for Major Wright for another time? asked Colburn. Addressing him, she went on, Do I have to ask you again to sit down? He lowered himself into the seat, wondering who the fourth was for. After your recent behaviour, said Colburn, I argued long and hard against your inclusion in the operation we're about to discuss. Unfortunately, due to your history and unique position, I was given no choice. She paused, looking at him sourly. I hope I don't need to impress upon you the importance of keeping the information you're about to learn to yourself. When Colburn didn't like you, she really didn't hold back. He was insulted by the insinuation of distrust, but only replied, Of course not, Brigadier. If I might explain? Merlin asked. Colburn's expression hardened further, but she nodded. Turning to Wright, the alien said, I've proposed another mission to strike at the heart of the EAC, and we need your help. Ignoring Merlin, he asked Colburn, The Dweer again? It would be the Alliance's third attempt on her life. Yes. Brigadier, isn't this getting a bit old hat? We tried twice already, at the cost of many lives. Not that you're in any kind of position to be questioning orders, Colburn seethed. But the Alliance is in a precarious state. We barely managed to retake Jamaica, and now we're holding on to it by the skin of our teeth. The offensive in the Caribbean cost us heavily in personnel, armaments and other infrastructure we will struggle to replace. If we can remove Dwyer Orr from the equation, it will bring the war to a swift end and save lives. What she said made sense, but Wright had the weirdest impression from her words. It was like it wasn't really her speaking. As he paused, uncertain how to respond, Arthur spoke. You know Talon well. We need you. Ellis? When we left the B.I., Merlin said, I was happy to leave Talon there for the time being. I was unsure where Carla Orr would go. There was a chance she would return to her castle, in which case Talon's location was convenient. But the Dweer has chosen to play it safe and remain on her flagship, the Belladonna. I was wondering how things would play out, waiting for the sign that would indicate which way to move, when I learned something significant about the gallant. Colburn folded her arms over her chest. The ship has a cloaking device, she interjected, in the tone of getting something out of the way. A prototype the space fleet was fitting and testing prior to the Battle of the Brez. It's why the gallant was held back. When Admiral Yorkson informed me of the ship's special capability, 
Merlin said. Everything slotted into place. The way forward became clear. Merlin proposes the gallant approach the Belladonna while cloaked, said Colburn. We board the ship, take over control and kill the Dwyer. But specifically, it must be Arthur or Talon who assassinates the Dwyer, Merlin explained. The brigadier rolled her eyes. I don't think it matters, but who am I to... The office door opened and Lieutenant General Carroll entered. Wright and Colburn got to their feet and saluted. Brigadier, Major, at ease, said Carroll, parking himself in the empty seat. Where have you got to? Major Wright knows the operation plan, Colburn replied. Ah, good. It's a risky enterprise, I have to admit, but if we can succeed, it should put an end to the war entirely. I've always believed the fanaticism the Dwyer generates has been our greatest foe. Once she's out of the way, the EAC will fall apart. Most of her followers are ignorant and easily led. They just want something to believe in. If we remove the Dwyer and give them something more benign to latch onto, divine herbs or reading the future in compacted trash, something like that, our problems will disappear. Or someone else to believe in, said Merlin. Yes, perhaps we can give them another charismatic leader to follow. I know just the person. Carol patted Arthur's back. But that's a discussion for another time. For now, we need to focus on removing the Dwyer. If I might ask something, said Wright. No need to stand on ceremony, Major, said Carol. You have permission to speak freely. How is Talon Ellis supposed to factor into this? She's no longer a Marine and she's desperate to find her children. I doubt she'll agree to take part in a mission. She must, said Merlin. Her presence is essential. Why, Wright growled. I know she's good, excellent in fact, but we have plenty of... She's essential, Merlin shot back. The silence that followed was uncomfortable. No one would meet Wright's questioning gaze except Arthur, who, after a moment, said, If Merlin says we need her... We need her, TJ. The alien said, I would explain. Great, said Wright, because I'd love to hear an explanation. But it would take far too long, Merlin concluded. You'll have to trust me. Wright snorted at the notion of having a smidgen of trust in him. Rightly or wrongly, Talon Ellis is discharged. She's a free agent. We can't compel her to do anything. That's where you come in, Major, said Carol. Brigadier Colburn informs me you have a special relationship with Ellis. His eyes widening, Wright looked at the Brigadier. She stared stonily back at him. I'm sorry, he said to Carol acidly, but you've been misinformed. My relationship with Talon Ellis is, and always has been, entirely professional. Now, now, said the Lieutenant General, lifting his hands as if to forestall an argument. I wasn't casting aspersions on your professionalism, Major. But you were her CO for most of her service, and you did act, shall we say, prematurely in discharging her. The woman met the criteria, Wright retorted. She's the only remaining parent to two young children. I don't know how she was even recruited in the first place. I guess the sergeant wanted to make his quota. Ellis deserved her discharge, and though I didn't go through the appropriate steps, it was because the situation didn't allow it. I've received a warning that's gone on my record, and that's it, the end. She's gone, and she won't be coming back. Unfortunately, Carol said, it isn't the end. We require her abilities again. 
Due to the unusual circumstances of her discharge, her comm implant wasn't removed. So we tried comming her, but... She's in hostile territory, exclaimed Wright. The Crusaders could have picked up her location. You risked her life. This was her reply, said Colburn tersely, sliding an interface across the table. He read the response, blanching a little at the cursing. He'd heard some rich language in his time in the Royal Marines. Ellis's was up there with the best of them. I'm not surprised, Wright said. She probably guessed it's him who wants her back. He glared at Merlin. The alien we've welcomed with open arms, not knowing what he is, where he's from or why he's here. Right, Colburn warned. Brigadier, he replied. Lieutenant General, you know as well as I do the massive risk we're taking in allowing an unknown entity to influence the actions of the Britannic Alliance. It's madness. That's enough, Major, ordered Carol. So he couldn't speak freely after all. Merlin sat passively, expressionless. Arthur had his head down. Wright clenched his jaw so tightly his teeth ground together. Colburn agreed with him. He knew she did. Yet she wouldn't speak her mind in front of Carol or any of the other higher-ups. Something needed to be done about Merlin. He was hell-bent on controlling the BA and eliminating all. Why? What did he care about human affairs? So that's why I'm here, Wright said dully. Sudden weariness and a sense of powerlessness hitting him. You want me to find Ellis and ask her to take part in the mission? Exactly, said Carol. Communication with the West BI resistance is sporadic and unreliable. The most recent report we had stated she'd left the group you met on your mission there. Then I asked the brigadier to try quickly calming her with the result you've seen. We need someone to speak to her face to face, persuade her of the urgency and importance of the task we have in mind. She'll be searching for her children. Whatever she's doing, Carol said, we need her to come back. Wright sighed and shook his head. And what if she's found them? You want me to ask her to abandon them again? I'm sure she'll be able to find someone to leave them with while she's gone. Wright looked into the Lieutenant General's eyes. The man's callousness was appalling. Look at it this way, Carol went on. If she kills the Dweer, the EAC will fall, her homeland will be free and her children will be safe forever. Tell her that. I'm sure you'll be able to convince her. If I find her. I have every confidence in you, said Carol. He rose, saying, Take 24 hours to recuperate before you set off. I'll leave the brigadier to brief you on the mission details. After he left... Tension hung in the air. Wright felt trapped, almost as badly as he'd been at the barricade in Kingston. He couldn't imagine anything in the world he wanted to do less than attempt to drag Tail and Ellis away from trying to find her kids. Unless it was to explain it was all Merlin's idea. Yet what could he do? The order came from the Lieutenant General himself. Eventually, he said, If I'm to do this, I want to take Arthur with me. If he had to find Talon, he could take the opportunity to remove Arthur from Merlin's influence. It was Arthur the Alliance leaders were in love with, based on his history. If he was physically separated from the alien, he might begin to understand Merlin was dangerous and he shouldn't go along with whatever he said. You aren't in a position to dictate conditions, said Colburn icily. We can come to the B.I. with you, said Merlin, if that's what you want. Not you, just Arthur. Out of the question, the alien said. Then I won't do it. Colburn's eyes blazed. Are you refusing a direct order? 
I'll resign. You know that isn't how it works. Wright slammed her desk and leapt to his feet, reckless insanity racing in his veins. Feeling as though he was watching himself from a corner of the room, he said, You want me to persuade Ellis to put her life in danger and risk leaving her kids orphaned in hostile territory, all on the whim of a goddamned alien. Something's up with you. Since when did you become his puppet? He jabbed a finger in Merlin's direction. I don't want to do this, he went on through clenched teeth. It's wrong. You know it's wrong too, but you're going along with it, just doing what you're told without question. Maybe it's time we started questioning things, Brigadier. Colburn stared at him for a cold, hard minute. Your request is granted. Arthur and only Arthur will accompany you. Merlin shrugged. However, continued Colburn, before you set out, I want you to undertake a psych evaluation. When Wright went to protest, she cut in, That's an order, Major. Chapter 15 Lorcan pushed back his covers and climbed wearily out of bed. He'd been sleeping badly, but he didn't think he'd slept at all the previous night. Despite the many years that had passed since he'd begun living permanently aboard the Brez, he still preferred to use the term night. Naturally, there was no night or day on the ship or on her sisters, Balor and Bamba. Work on all three vessels continued around the clock. However, it was convenient to have the majority of his office and supervisory employees carrying out their duties at roughly the same time. He looked up and left, activating a clock display in his vision. 11.30am? He had slept after all. Rubbing the sleep from his eyes, he padded to the bathroom. The staff in the control centre would be wondering what had happened to him. It was strange no one had checked on him. Or maybe they had, and his implant had reported he was asleep. Or perhaps they hadn't, not caring whether he was OK. He began his morning ablutions. Things had changed since Iolani Hale had arrived. The atmosphere had lightened. He didn't like it. Building humanity's first colony ships was serious work. Leaving the solar system and travelling to new habitable planets was humankind's greatest endeavour. The names of the people who worked with him would go down in history along with his own, both on Earth and in the new civilizations they helped to found. Their work was not supposed to be fun. Did they understand the risks of losing concentration? The smallest error would be magnified thousands of times once the ships were underway. A little thoughtlessness, a simple mistake, could spell disaster for millions. Despite Hale's shocking and harsh criticisms of the project, he had, on reflection, grown to somewhat appreciate her attempts to set them on a better path to success. But this new cheeriness, this conviviality, had to stop. She might know her stuff when it came to science, but he was the expert on workplace attitude and culture. After the blower had dried him off, he got dressed, picked up a snack bar from the stash in his living room and left for his two-minute commute. When he reached the control centre, the doors opened on a shocking scene. No one was working. Rather than being hunched over their consoles as usual, his management team was standing around in small groups. What was worse, they were holding what looked like alcoholic drinks and were chatting to each other. It beggared belief, but his staff had taken advantage of his unexpected absence and was holding a party. Lorcan. Iolani separated from a group and wove her way through the throng to join him. I'm glad you decided to come. What? he spluttered, hardly able to speak. 
What the hell is going on? Didn't you get my message? She was looking up at him, confused. Then she appeared to register his surprise and outrage. You didn't. I see. Well, this is awkward. It's probably best I speak to you outside. You are not speaking to me outside or anywhere. Everyone, put down your drinks and get back to work immediately. Hale's dog suddenly bounded out from somewhere and loped over to Lorcan. After a cursory sniff, they stiffened, backed off, and softly growled, lifting their lips from their long teeth. Dogs in the workplace! Lorcan yelled, his voice lifting almost to a shriek. Lock them up in your cabin now, or I'll put them out the nearest airlock myself. You'll do no such thing, Hale retorted. She signalled to the animals. They lay down on their stomachs, though neither took their eyes off Lorcan. If you refuse to speak to me privately, I'll have to explain in front of everyone. Two valued colleagues of mine arrived this morning and I was holding a short informal gathering over an early lunch to welcome them and introduce them to the team. Without my permission? I sent you a comm at eight o'clock. You didn't read it. How was I to know you were going to have a lie-in? That's irrelevant. Why on earth would you think holding a party on office time was appropriate or acceptable? Do you think I pay you to socialise and get pissed? I just explained we're taking an early... A man approached. Middle-aged with white hair and a pepper and salt beard, he had to be one of Hale's newly arrived colleagues. Ua Talman, I apologise for the mix-up. If I'd known Ayalani's reception would cause a problem, I wouldn't have agreed to it. It's fine, Anders, said Hale. This isn't your fault. Her eyes narrowed as she looked at the person whose fault she clearly thought it was. Quiet conversation had started up around them. Maybe it would be better if we continued this discussion elsewhere, Anders suggested. But Lorcan insists we broadcast the misunderstanding to all and sundry, Iolani countered sarcastically. We can continue the discussion when my employees are back at their consoles and your dogs are safely locked up. Anders gave a small cough. Iolani. He looked at her, his expression pained. Oh, all right. She gestured at her dogs, who rose and trotted to her side. This is for you, though, she said to her friend, not him. As she was on her way out, Lorcan announced to the room, Everyone back to work. The festivities are over. You will all make up the time lost today before you leave. Groups of people began to disperse, with soft grumbling and unfriendly glances in Lorcan's direction. He couldn't care less. He was their employer, not their friend. Over-familiarity with staff bred laziness and sloppiness. While we're here, said Anders, might I introduce you to another of Ailani's friends who will be helping with the project? Please do, Lorcan replied. Let's get the formalities out of the way. The person in question was already walking toward them. This second unfamiliar face in his control centre was more pleasant to Lorcan's eyes than the first. She was around the same age as Hale, though she couldn't look more different. She was almost as tall as him. Her dark blonde hair was swept into a pleat at the back of her head. Her features were even and she moved delicately like a doe. Her smile was warm as she held out her hand. Sorry about the kerfuffle. I'm Camilla Lebedev. Lorcan felt soft skin and a firm grasp as he shook hands with her. Apology accepted. Now Hale was out of the way and everyone had returned to doing their jobs, he was calming down. Anders Christiansen, said Anders, also shaking Lorcan's hand. I'm pleased to make both your acquaintances, Lorcan said. 
Dr Lebedev, I've read some of your papers on human immunology, and Dr Christensen, I admire your work in genetics tremendously. I'm honoured you agreed to come here, and I'm grateful you've agreed to spend your precious time working on my project. I only wish our introduction could have been under more favourable circumstances. Let's pretend it never happened, said Camilla amiably. Lorcan was finding it hard to take his eyes off her. He'd seen vids of Camilla Lebedev at various talks and on media panels, but meeting her in the flesh, she looked different. Suddenly he realised what it was about her appearance that was striking him so forcibly. She reminded him of Grace. Ayalani has set up laboratories for you, he said, dragging himself back to the present. Would you like to see them? I would, said Camilla. How about you, Anders? To be honest, I was already tired after the shuttle flight, and socialising at short notice has squeezed out the last of my energy. If it's OK with you, Lorcan, I'd like to take a couple of hours to rest and recuperate. Of course, Lorcan replied. Take the rest of the day off, and tomorrow too if you need it. I grant you it might not seem like it after what's happened, but I'm no slave driver. I never thought you were. See you tomorrow, Camilla. Lorcan led his new employee through the Brezzi's passageways, taking his time, enjoying the pleasant sense of familiarity about her. Have you lived aboard a starship before? he asked. I know it isn't safe to spend much time in space any more, but scientific research vessels used to be quite common. Sadly, no. I was offered the opportunity, but I always had something else to do that was more urgent or interesting. This will be a first for me. Then I'm doubly grateful you agreed to come. Ayalani is an old, good friend who never asks for favours. It would have felt churlish to turn her down, but I'm also intrigued by what you're attempting here. And I have to confess, funding is getting harder to come by every year. The prospect of not having to beg for every penny was appealing. How about you? How do you cope with living out here? I enjoy it. The Brez has everything I need, including green spaces now that several habitats are up and running. Plus, I have to admit I'm a workaholic. If I spend too much time away from the project, I begin to twitch. He did a bad impression of a nervous tick. Camilla laughed. I'm sure you don't, though I empathise with being a workaholic. She went on, but don't you feel out of touch with what's happening on Earth? I've had my fill of Earth affairs. So much so, I'm spending trillions just to get away from them. Hmm, I feel like that sometimes myself. I take it you haven't heard the latest then? Lorcan doubted any news he'd missed would interest him. Nevertheless, he replied, I don't think so. The Britannic Alliance is said to have discovered an ancient artefact that will help them in their war with the EAC. An ancient artefact? That sounds like something more up the Dweer's Street. I know, right? I thought I must have misunderstood when I first heard about it but it belongs to the Alliance. What is this thing exactly? No one knows. Whatever it is, Dwyer Orr is so scared of it, she's fled to space. Admiral Bujold had reported the Dwyer was aboard the Belladonna, though he hadn't given the fact much thought. As long as the Crusaders stayed away from his precious ships, he didn't care what the madwoman did. Ayalani Hale marched up to them. I thought you might be on your way to the labs. I've locked my dogs up, as you put it, but I'm warning you, things are going to change around here, whether you like it or not. Chapter 16 Right-eyed the gigantic sword Arthur was insisting on bringing along on their trip to find Talon Ellis. Only he and Arthur were in the cabin. 
Merlin was nowhere to be seen. Do you want a closer look? Arthur asked. The sword was enclosed in a plain scabbard printed on the gallant, which was attached to a belt around the king's waist. The weapon stood out painfully, and Wright wondered how on earth they were going to remain inconspicuous with Arthur carrying it wherever they went. Sure, he replied. Arthur drew it out and gently grasped the blade so he could hand it to Wright hilt first. Take care, it's very sharp. He took it. He'd trained in knives for hand-to-hand -hand combat, but he was out of practice, and in truth he wasn't comfortable with anything bigger than a steak knife. Most of his engagements involved killing at a distance. The sword was surprisingly light for its size. As Arthur had warned, the edges were very fine and sharp. The solid section of blade ended about 30 metres from the tip. From there, a groove ran down the centre on both sides to the hilt. To channel away blood, Wright guessed, a little nauseated. The hilt was a wonder of craftsmanship, reminding him of the talk Arthur wore around his neck. Two slim dragons writhed from the guard to the grip, their legs forming the guard and their bodies entwining to create the grip. The pommel was a lion's head, fangs bared. He examined the metal. It looked like regular steel. He didn't know much about the history of sword-making, but he guessed that in Arthur's time the craft hadn't developed to creating ironwork of this calibre. Are you sure this is the same sword you used in your former life? he asked. He wondered if Merlin had returned to the little church in the intervening centuries and replaced it with a more advanced model. Arthur smiled politely as if the question was dumb. I am sure. Where did you get it? This question conjured a bigger smile. You wouldn't believe me if I told you. But, in short, a lady gave it to me. She must have been a hell of a blacksmith. She was neither a blacksmith nor a swordsmith. Women didn't do that kind of work in my time. Wright guessed Ellis probably knew the story of how Arthur got his sword. She was a fountain of knowledge on the subject of Arthur and his table of knights, or whatever it was. He gave the sword back. It's not what I'm used to, but I have to admit it's a beautiful weapon. It's strange, Arthur mused as he took it. I didn't know Merlin had sealed Excalibur away along with my armour. I gave it to one of my knights to return to the lady who had given it to me. But I'm glad he took it. I don't feel complete without it. He slid the blade into its sheath. Wright wasn't surprised Arthur had given his sword a name. He also wasn't surprised he was so attached to it. When your weapon was the only thing standing between life and death, you tended to start seeing it as a personal friend. A lot of marines got attached to their pulse rifles. I understand how much it means to you, he said. But once we're planet side... Carrying that around is going to make life difficult for us. TJ, you made strong demands before you would agree to go to find Talon. Bringing Excalibur with me is my demand. All right, I get it. Merlin arrived, looking surprisingly chipper. Wright had expected him to make a bigger objection to being left behind, but he didn't seem to care. Are you leaving soon? he asked. The dropship pilot is waiting for us now, replied Wright. Then let me wish you a safe journey and a successful mission. I have a feeling you will find Talon Ellis without too much difficulty. Is that so? Have you been reading the signs? For someone who has no idea what they're talking about, you're very scornful. I'd have a better idea if a certain person didn't play their cards so close to their chest. Knowledge is a precious thing, said Merlin. 
your right to desire it. Unfortunately, some things are beyond human beings' understanding. You'll have to, how should I put it, trust me on this. Arthur interjected, I have everything I need, Major. We shouldn't keep the pilot waiting. Ever the diplomat, the king was trying to head off the impending argument. But Wright wasn't about to have it out with Merlin anyway. Attempting to get information out of the creature was a pointless exercise. Yet he couldn't help saying as he and Arthur left, Trust is earned, Merlin, and you haven't done anything to earn mine. Their route to West B.I. was to be the same one as they'd taken when they'd attempted to assassinate the Dweer. The dropship pilot would take them to Ireland, and then they would cross the Irish Sea by boat. They would make their way inland on foot, beginning their search for Ellis at the hideout in the Priselli Hills. As he undertook the first part of the journey with Arthur, the only passengers aboard the small vessel, he hoped it wouldn't take them long to find her. They couldn't survive in hostile territory indefinitely. The longer they were there, the greater were their chances of being discovered by crusaders, especially with Arthur carrying a massive sword. But Ellis had said the king was impervious to pulse rounds. After witnessing his transformation from mummy to living, breathing human being, Wright had to concede anything was possible. Ellis had also told him Arthur had turned into a killing machine at the invasion launch ceremony. That sounded far-fetched, but then so had her explanation of who Arthur was, and that had turned out to be true. He didn't know what to make of it all. Maybe if they were captured, the Dweer couldn't hurt Arthur. The same couldn't be said for himself. Now that Arthur was away from Merlin for the first time since the alien had coalesced from a cloud on the hull of the Fearless, Wright was eager to take the opportunity to probe him for information. His first question had been plaguing him ever since the meeting where he'd been assigned the mission. Arthur. Do you know why Merlin wants Talon so badly for this attack on the Dweer? When I was king, I had many knights to defend my kingdom, dispense justice and maintain order. One of these was a very special man, a perfect knight in all ways except one. An expression of pain and sorrow twisted the man's features. Wright wondered what the perfect knight's flaw had been. Whatever it was, it had left a deep wound. After a pause, Arthur went on. No man could stand against him in battle, and in all knightly tests he was unbeaten. I don't know what happened to him after my final battle, but I doubt he was killed. What I do know is, at some point in his life, he must have fathered a child, because you think Talon is his descendant. As soon as Arthur had mentioned the knight's prowess, Wright had put two and two together. That's what Merlin told you? But how would that work over thousands of years, hundreds of generations? Arthur looked mildly annoyed. I'm sorry but it's hard to believe your knight's abilities could be passed on so purely down the centuries. It isn't as simple as you think, said Arthur. Anything involving Morgan Le Fay or Merlin is extraordinary. My fate is tied up with the two of them, and, my guess is, so is Talon's. Are you saying Merlin had an influence on her abilities? He may have. Not directly, but through her ancestor. Our friend's fighting skills are not just unusually good, they're uncanny. It wouldn't surprise me if Merlin had something to do with them. He didn't tell you? Merlin only reveals his secrets when it's useful to him. You can say that again, but I thought you and he were close. We are but he is still his own man. He isn't a man at all. 
But how to explain that to someone who only just found out the Earth orbits the Sun? Does Taylor know about her ancestry? If she does, it isn't through me. I didn't know about it until Merlin identified her when we sparred with staves. After that, I didn't have an opportunity to explain it to her. Arthur, can you tell me something? Why do you put so much faith in Merlin? Do you think he has your best interests at heart? I understand why you're suspicious. Many people of my time were suspicious of Merlin too. Some believed he was the devil's progeny. But before I became king, my country was a terrible, lawless place. Barbarous tribes raided the coastal areas or stole land and livestock and tried to settle. During my kingship, with Merlin's help, I put an end to all that. It became safe for ordinary people to travel through the forests, for families to farm their land without fear of enemies burning their crops, raping the women and stealing children. By the time my challenger rose up against me, my kingdom was a peaceful, prosperous place. I could not have managed it without Merlin. I know he's easy to dislike, but I believe he has my and your interests at heart in all he does. Wright didn't agree. From what he'd seen, the alien's motives were obscure, though now he could see better why Arthur stuck with him. Why do you think he kept you alive all these years? he asked. Why not find another Arthur to make king? I'm not certain. Maybe he needs me in particular, or maybe it pleases him. He's hard to understand. Major Wright, said Colburn, via com. After asking Arthur to excuse him for a moment, he replied, Yes, Brigadier. I thought I should let you know we've lost Merlin. Lost him? Not long after you left, I tried to find him to discuss, you know. He couldn't be found. Lieutenant General Carroll ordered a shipwide search. He isn't anywhere on the gallant. Could he have stowed away on a shuttle? Yours is the only ship to depart since the last time he was seen, and as we both know, he doesn't need a ship to survive space. Chapter 17 It'll take at least a week to get there, said Mylir. We should allow at least ten days in case of hold-ups, preferably two weeks. He sat at a table with his brothers. The four men huddled in as they discussed the next act of resistance against the Crusaders. Four weeks there and back, it's a long time to spend in the wild, his brother Madog cautioned. Every day we're out there increases our chances of being picked up. Are we any safer here? asked Mark. They're bound to find this place sooner or later. Medwin, the fourth brother, said, I've been saying the same thing for months. We should move around regularly, not stay in one hideout all the time. If you know of anywhere else we could go, said Madog, I'd love to hear it. If we could stick to discussing the plan, Mylir said, glaring from face to face. Medwin lifted his hands appeasingly. I'm only saying, Mylir's right, said Madog. We can decide whether to move to another hideout when we get back, in about three weeks to a month. He addressed the last comment to Mylir. Midsummer is in two weeks, he replied. The festivities are going to peak then. I'd feel happier if we set out tomorrow to be sure we don't miss it. Talon had been hearing snippets about the brothers' planned trip to Anis Morn for several days, but she hadn't been included in the discussions. I want to come too, she interjected, walking over to the group of men. Mylir looked up. No, you aren't healed properly yet. I'm a lot better, and the exercise will do me good. We're talking thirty kilometres a day over hilly ground, said Madog. That's not a little light physiotherapy. I can manage, Talon protested. I'm from around here, remember? 
You think I'm not used to hills? No one's saying you don't know what you're talking about, said Mark. I am, said Medwin, addressing the others. We can't afford to take along anyone who isn't in good shape. What if she can't keep up or get under cover quickly if we see a patrol? Hey, Taylor exclaimed. I'm right here. If you have an objection, say it to my face. But he only scowled and refused to look at her. Medwin has a point, Melia said. This is going to be a tough mission. You might feel okay now, but what about after three or four days on the road? I know you want to help, but you could be a liability. If I start to slow you down, I'll turn back. And what if you're seen and put the EAC on our trail? Medwin asked. Now you're being ridiculous. Are you going to insist every member of the resistance doesn't leave the hideout all the time you're gone? No, but I trained and operated as a Royal Marine," said Taylor. "I have to admit, sometimes I wasn't the best Marine in the world, but I still know more about military assaults than the four of you put together. You'd be idiots not to take me along. We'd be idiots if we took a cripple with us," Medwin said. Just loud enough to be heard, Mylir said, "Brother, your mouth has got you into trouble more than once. Keep running it, and you'll be the one left behind." Taylor felt bad for coming between the siblings. It was true she wasn't a hundred percent fit yet, but her wound was nearly healed and only hurt at night or when she wasn't distracted. She was confident that in a week or so she'd be back to normal. However. By then, the brothers would be halfway to Inismorn, and the Crusaders' midsummer festival they intended to target. I'll leave you to decide," she said. "I can't make you take me, but if you do, I think I can help." She went to the corner of the underground chamber where a makeshift kitchen had been set up. It wasn't much; just a stove that ran on batteries and a collection of battered pots and pans. An older man called David was the cook. He couldn't get around very well any more, so his contribution to the cause consisted of creating meals from whatever supplies the fighters managed to steal, and generally keeping the place clean and organized. He was about the only person who cared about the living conditions. Most of the rest of the group were, it had to be said, complete slobs. He was leaning over the stove, stirring something in a pot, and didn't notice Taylor approach. When she reached his side, he jumped a little, and the spoon banged against the pan. He seemed alarmed. "What do you want? Dinner won't be ready for another half an hour." "I thought you might need some help." "No, no, no need. Go and relax." "I don't want to relax. I'm bored. There has to be something I can do." She was puzzled. She spent most of the previous afternoon helping David in the kitchen. It seemed grateful. Now, for some reason, his attitude toward her had done an about face. His shoulders slumped. All right. How about you stir this for me while I try to find the salt? I made the mistake of leaving it out after yesterday's meal, and now it's gone walkabout. She took the spoon from him and peered into the big pot. He was making a stew of mostly root vegetables and beans. She tasted a little and grimaced. It did need salt, but also something else. While David was doddering around the room, she peeked into the boxes of dried ingredients on the shelf next to the cooker. There it was. The date on the box was the previous year, but this was the kind of thing that didn't go off. Its flavor only lessened over time. She opened the box, finding it surprisingly full. She used to use this in her cooking all the time, but just as she was about to add the dried fibers to the stew, a hand fastened on her arm. "What do you think you're doing?" asked David, peering into the box. He read the label: "Horse radish." What makes you think my stew needs horseradish? I thought it could do with a little pepping up. Hand it over. He beckoned with his fingers. 
Talon hesitated, the dried horseradish fibres poised to be dropped into the pot. Hand it over, repeated David, and step away from the stove. But he stared at her with hard eyes. Holding his gaze, she silently pushed the horseradish into the box and closed the lid. She gave it to him. Did you find the salt? she asked. Yes, thank you. He returned the box to the shelf and moved between her and the cooking pot so that she found herself looking at his back. Dismissed by his body language, Talon disconsolately went to sit in the place where she slept. Talon, said Mylil, noticing her, we discussed your participation in the mission. We decided you're welcome to come, if you're sure that's what you want. I am, and I will. Thanks, guys. Medwin's expression was cloudy, and he wouldn't look at her. She wondered if the brothers had taken a vote, and it had been three to one. Grubs up, David announced. Clear the table. Great, said Mylir, leaning back. I'm starving. Then a look of concern, almost fear, came over his features. He glanced from the kitchen area to Talon, as if twigging she'd just come from there. Did, did Talon help cook it? The four men shared expressions of alarm. No, she didn't, David replied. This is entirely my own work. No additional ingredients. Phew, said Mark, visibly relaxing. Dish it up then. Chapter 19 After several days of trekking across the West B.I. countryside, Wright and Arthur had stopped for the night in an abandoned farmhouse. The area near Dweir Orr's castle was being closely watched, so they'd been forced to land much farther north and make their way cross-country to the Prizeli hideout. He doubted Talon was still there, but it would be a starting point in their search. The fighters would probably know where she'd gone next. The crossing from Ireland had gone smoothly, but getting out of West B.I. was going to be harder than entering it. He hadn't been able to give their Irish helpers a firm date for their return. Spending time with Arthur had been an education. In his years of military service, Wright had met countless men and women from different cultures and backgrounds, but they all shared one similarity. They were of this time. Arthur was not. Wright found it hard to articulate his impression, even to himself, but it was as if the king saw reality in an entirely different way. For one thing, he was deeply religious. Every night before going to sleep, he would get down on his knees, bow his head and clasp his hands in prayer. And the man's religiosity extended much further than regularly praying. He seemed to see evidence of his beliefs all around him. Once, when they were nearly out of water, they'd happened upon a stream, and Arthur saw it as a sign that God was helping them. Another time, when they got lost, the ancient king was sure an evil spirit was leading them astray. It was like he was living in another world. Another interesting thing about him was his expertise at living in the wild. He could forecast rain hours before it arrived, and he seemed to have an instinctive sense of direction, even when it was cloudy and they hadn't seen the sun or stars for days, he knew where the points of the compass lay. When asked how he was so certain, he said he just knew, and he was surprised that Wright didn't. Possibly he was subconsciously reading the landscape or other signs, perhaps something he'd been taught as a child and internalised. Arthur also spotted animal trails where Wright saw only ground cover or undergrowth and he had, it seemed to Wright, a somewhat unhealthy obsession with their droppings. He could tell what animal had left them and how long ago. Given free rein, Wright was sure he would have set off to hunt them. 
He didn't like to eat the dry rations they'd brought along. One thing Wright knew, accompanying Arthur was a re-education on everything he saw around him. If the sky was clear at night, the king explained the constellations he saw and the stories behind them. In the forests, he knew the name of every tree and the various uses of their wood. The king's ease of existence within the natural landscape was surprising. Poor King Frederick, who had only reigned a few weeks before Dwyer Orr had murdered him, probably wouldn't have had the first idea about anything that existed beyond the walls of his palatial homes. Arthur had been royalty too, but perhaps his beginnings had been more humble. Good night, said the king, settling into his sleeping bag. Good night. You're sure if we make good speed tomorrow we should reach the Priselli Hills by sunset? Yes, that's my estimation. I hope we find Talon there. Me too. Wright fell asleep quickly, but seemingly only minutes later he was awake again. In the darkness it was hard to tell how much time had passed. Arthur's heavy breathing indicated he hadn't woken. Wright wondered what had pulled him from his slumber. Normally he would have been irritated. He hated being woken up, but in enemy territory he had greater cause for concern. He listened. Raindrops pattered on the rickety farmhouse roof and the old concrete of the yard. He couldn't hear anything else, and nothing seemed to be moving within his field of vision. Or was it? He was facing the doorless opening to the outside. An empty window stood on each side of it. All three revealed nothing but the deepest night. Then he heard a very slight variation in the steady drumming of the rain. A regular sound, like... He reached for the beamer he'd placed under the folded sweater he was using as a pillow. Arthur, he hissed, wishing he was close enough to poke the man with his foot. The king slept on. He was sure he'd heard footsteps. Someone, either EAC or a member of the resistance, was slowly creeping up on them. As far as he could tell, it was only one person, so naturally he or she was being cautious. Arthur! Nothing. He lifted the beamer and aimed it at the doorway. A figure separated from the darkness and stepped inside. Wright rose onto his elbow and tried to press the trigger, but suddenly his intention to fire faded away and he wondered why he was holding a weapon. You can shoot me if you like, Major Wright, but I'm warning you, it won't have any effect. Merlin, Wright said angrily, I was wondering when you would turn up. Thank you for the warm reception. I thought I'd made it clear I didn't want you around. If you insist on coming with us, I'm out. You can forget all about attacking the Dwyer's ship. Arthur was rousing. My old friend, you've come to help us find Talon? Exactly right. I don't think you'll manage it without me. We're not going to be managing it with you, retorted Wright. You might not understand it yet, said the alien, but you need me. I would explain, but I wouldn't understand. Yeah, I get it. I don't care. Wright sat up to better address the shadowy figure in the dark. You either let us do this on our own, or the deal's off. You might have pulled the wool over the Alliance's eyes, but not mine. I know there's a lot more to this than you're telling us, and you're not going to use me to achieve your aims. And if you think Ellis is more likely to agree to your scheme with you around to persuade her, you aren't the all-knowing superior extraterrestrial being you make yourself out to be. She doesn't trust you any more than I do. Perhaps you know her feelings better than I, Merlin conceded. But you don't have the slightest idea what's happening here. These events are beyond human comprehension, and if you value the future of your planet, 
you would be wise to listen to me. Merlin has always been a faithful and trustworthy guide, Arthur gently interjected. I've known him a long time, and he helped me greatly in my former life. Wright ignored him. What Arthur was saying might be true, but it applied to the world of three and a half thousand years ago, not today. What do you mean beyond human comprehension? Try this human, then we'll see. The whites of the alien's eyes were barely visible as he held Wright's gaze before appearing to come to a decision. He sat on the cold flagstones and crossed his legs. Earth is one of the very few planets in this galaxy inhabited by an intelligent species. There are powers who care very much about what happens here. Over the history of your world, tens of thousands of conflicts have taken place. In Arthur's time, there were hundreds of controlling factions. Now, three organisations battle to decide Earth's fate. The Antarctic Project would see her stripped of resources and abandoned. The Earth Awareness Crusade want to return her to a state where traditional science is rejected in favour of a less um, a reliable understanding of the physical universe. The Britannic Alliance wants to remain on the current path of progress towards a better, safer, fairer civilization. The powers I represent support the Alliance's stance. I'm here to help it fulfil its aims. Is that explanation enough for you? No. Merlin had mostly told Wright what he already knew, except the part about the powers and his role. That was not at all difficult to understand, so either the alien's comment about events beyond human comprehension was bullshit, or he was feeding him a line. Why do you need to find Ellis? he asked. What do you know that we don't, and how do you know it? The alien smiled. For the first time since Wright had known him, the smile reached his eyes. Just as there are powers humans know nothing about, there are universal laws and patterns that shape all our destinies. Many of them even I cannot grasp, but I can read the signs of their operation. Don't bother asking me for more details. No human language has the capacity to express what I mean. Why haven't you told the Alliance all this? I prefer to rely on Arthur's legend to convince them of my usefulness. It's simpler and, as you said, the notion of an alien civilization exerting control over human affairs is uh, disconcerting. Well, the cat's out of the bag now, isn't it? As soon as it's safe to calm Colburn, I'll tell her everything you've said. I'll deny it. Who will they believe, I wonder? I read your psych assessment report. He smiled again. Wright's stomach plummeted. The assessment had gone badly. He'd recounted everything that had happened in the counter-offensive in Jamaica and he'd lost it. He'd been surprised Colburn had allowed him to continue with the mission to find Ellis, but he guessed Merlin had probably insisted. Arthur said, Would you agree to Merlin helping us to find Talon and then you and I talk to her? He wanted to say no. He wanted nothing to do with the creep, least of all introducing him back into Talon's life. He'd feel like he betrayed her, but he couldn't see a way out of the situation. The only other option open to him was to desert, and he wasn't there yet. I'll sleep on it. As Wright lay on the hard floor, the sound of rain drumming in his ears, he recalled intending to shoot Merlin and the impulse inexplicably fading away. What had that been about? There was so much more to the alien than met the eye. Chapter 20 Suitable places in which to hold a meeting of Alliance and Jamaican representatives were few and far between. 
every substantial building still standing in Kingston after the battle for control of the city was internally wrecked. The ambassador's residence stank of human waste, infected wounds and death. The former seat of the temporary parliament had been partially destroyed in the coup, even before Dwyer Orr's forces attacked, and the crusaders had defiled the stately home they had commandeered for their seat of operations. Hans had proposed they use the university. The EAC's distrust and dislike of conventional education had meant that, after capturing and killing any academics or students they could find, they'd left the place alone, and the halls and lecture rooms had contained little in the way of food or regular everyday items to attract looters. How different the assembly was from the last general council meeting before everything had gone to pot. The ranks of military officers in their uniforms, the MPs in their smart suits, poor Queen Alice in her regalia. They seemed dreamlike to Hans, not actual memories of real people. And the splendid ornate wooden hall where the meeting had been held was a fantasy compared to the stark plain walls of the university's auditorium. The new BA military heads, Chief of Defence Staff Evans and Sea Lord Fox, looked somewhat dishevelled. Hans couldn't imagine Hennessy or Montague ever appearing less than perfectly dressed. He knew the fight for the Caribbean had been hard, but that was no excuse to allow standards to slip. Other Alliance representatives, including the BA's Foreign Secretary and Defence Secretary, looked smarter, but even their outfits were crumpled and seemed cheap, as if created by printer rather than human hands. The resistance leaders had more reason to appear rough and ready. Hans didn't know much about Devon's or Charles or the other leaders' backgrounds, but he doubted any had held positions of power. They were good men and women, honest, brave and principled, but they were not at ease with the etiquette of higher social echelons. Welcome to the first of what I hope will be many and fruitful discussions on the future of Jamaica, Hans said to the assembly. He'd persuaded the resistance to allow him to guide the talks. Not too many, Jonta, joked the Foreign Secretary, Blake. I think we don't have too much to discuss here, do we? Hans had thought all the BA government reps were new to him, but he suddenly realised he knew Blake from his time as head of CIS. He'd thought none of the government members living on the island had survived the invasion, but she clearly had. What had been her role? He had a vague idea she'd been a junior minister in the health department, how on earth had she risen to her current position so quickly? He guessed the sudden vacuum in the highest roles had sucked in all kinds of detritus from the lower ranks. I would say we have a great deal to discuss, Foreign Secretary, Hans replied. He had a tricky course to steer. The Jamaicans thought he was entirely on their side, desiring complete self-governance for the island while the BA knew he was playing a double game, that he would pretend to push for autonomy, but in fact he supported the alliance. I don't see why, said Blake. We had a clear structure for the government of Jamaica and the rest of the Caribbean not so long ago. All we have to do is to return to the way things were. It's actually the rebuilding effort and other support the alliance is prepared to offer that we're here to discuss, isn't it? Exactly, said Defence Secretary Michaels, a man Hans didn't recognise at all. As you might imagine, he went on, addressing the resistance leaders, our resources are extremely stretched at the moment. Naturally, we'll do everything in our power to help all we can. It's in all our best interests, after all. But it would be wise to prepare your followers for things to take much longer to return to normal than they might expect. Well, said Hans, pleased that Blake and Michaels were playing their parts effectively. 
It's only fair the Alliance should help Jamaica get to its feet again after so many years of exploitation of its people and siphoning off its most valuable assets. But perhaps it would also be wise to prepare yourselves for things to not return to how they were before the EAC invasion. I'm not sure what you mean, said Blake, in a low, menacing tone. What a good actress she was. I mean the cataclysmic disaster Jamaica has suffered is at least in part due to the Alliance's interference in its affairs. If the BA government hadn't transferred here, the island would not have been so attractive to the Crusaders. A continued Alliance presence here is something we Jamaicans must think about carefully. Sea Lord Fox snorted and said, So... You Jamaicans, making fun of Hans for ascribing the nationality to himself, want to have your cake and eat it. You want us to front the cost of all the repair work and then hand over control of the territory to you, receiving nothing in return. This isn't the first hint I've heard in that vein, but it's the first time I've heard it proposed formally. How is it any different from what you did to us? Charles growled. How many of us fronted the cost of the alliance with cheap labour and unfair trade practices? How long have you been draining the Caribbean in order to fund your royal palaces and dinner parties? If you think the alliance spends any more than a tiny percentage of its budget on the royal family, said Blake, you're mistaken. Please educate yourself if you wish your opinions to be respected. This attack caused an almost palpable shockwave of anger to pass through the Jamaicans. Hans heard the enraged murmurs and mentally scrambled to think of something to say that would calm the rising tensions. Before we can talk about budgets, he said, we should figure out what's needed here. The Alliance has already restored the net, which is great, but many areas are still without power or running water. It's safe to say, if we don't have these basic necessities restored, we'll see a massive outbreak of disease within the next few weeks. Yes, yes, said Michaels irritably. The Chief of Defence Staff has already allocated significant numbers of troops and sappers to repair power lines and water pipes but we're stretched thinner than we've ever been. You can't expect miracles, and you can't expect the Alliance to devote precious resources to these projects without the resumption of control, which seems to be the sticking point. I'll have to speak directly to the Prime Minister about the matter, but after what I've heard today, I'll be pushing for legally binding assurances that Jamaica will return to being within the Alliance and the seat of the BA's temporary parliament, until such time as we can return it to the Britannic Isles. I think that's reasonable. He turned to the Alliance representatives for their support. Blake nodded vigorously, and the military chiefs grunted their assent. What was Michaels doing? The Jamaicans would never sign anything that would give up their country to the BA again. Let's not be hasty, said Hans. The last few months have been devastating for the Caribbean and the Alliance. We all need time to reflect, take stock, and after careful consideration, figure out a mutually agreeable way forward. Resorting to legal agreements is heavy-handed and unnecessary at this early stage. We need to focus on the people of the islands and averting the impending humanitarian crisis. Didn't they understand from his message he had a handle on the situation and that he was going to work from within to bring Jamaica back into the fold? Surely these officials weren't so stupid they thought they could bully the locals into submission. He hadn't lived among them for long, but even he knew this was exactly the wrong tactic to employ. If they were pushed, they would push back, hard. Resentment and the desire for independence was strong. My men and women gave their lives for this country, Evans burst out. 
speaking aloud for the first time. I'll be damned if I see it leave the Alliance. Indeed, echoed Fox, leaning forward and glaring at the Jamaicans. I'd advise you all to think carefully about biting the hand that's fed you up till now. It would be very unwise for a small, poor country to leave the protection of its benefactor. You would also be weakening what's currently the only force for good in the world. How long do you think it would take Dwyer Orr to swoop in and finish you off after you boot us out, eh? How long will you survive your second dose of crusader zeal? Benefactor, muttered Devon. Then, louder, he repeated, Benefactor? My parents slave twelve hours a day in Alliance munitions plants that poisoned the air they breathed, the soil my grandparents farmed, and the seas we fish in. For what reward? Wages barely high enough to pay the rent and put food in our bellies. Do not talk to me about how we benefited from the Alliance. I'm done here. He stormed out. The other resistance leaders were not slow to follow him. Within half a minute, only Hans was left, facing the stunned members of the Alliance. That went well, a junior official quipped. It went very badly, said Hans quietly, gritting his teeth. Don't any of you understand this process has to be undertaken carefully? What process? asked Blake. Moving Jamaica toward independence? No, returning the country to the Alliance. What are you blathering about? asked Michaels. What happened to our exploitation of the Jamaican people and siphoning off the country's resources? I had to say that, Hans hissed, checking over his shoulder and hoping no resistance leaders lingered outside the closed door to eavesdrop. I have to. Make up your mind, Jonta, said Blake dryly. A moment ago you were Jamaican. When you decide which side you're on, let us know. For now, I think we need to step away, halt all work on rebuilding projects, and wait for legal assurances that Jamaica will remain an alliance territory. Are we agreed? She looked at her colleagues. No, you mustn't do that, said Hans. You'll ruin everything I've been working toward. Didn't you get my message? I think you might have spent a little too much time in the sun, sir, said the junior minister. Not unkindly. Maybe you should get yourself checked over. Do it quickly, though, added Michaels. Alliance medical support will be gone in a day or so. Now, who's for an early lunch? I'm famished. Ignoring Hans's protests, the delegation filed out of the auditorium. Chapter 21 Things were changing on the Brez, as Hale had warned, but not in the way Lorcan had feared. The arrival of Camilla and Anders had injected a breath of fresh air into the place. He hadn't realised until he noticed the change, but the atmosphere had grown monotonous and stale over the years. He'd thought Hale's presence would encourage slacking off and insubordination, it would be hard for her to rein in her resentment of his earlier treatment of her. But she and her scientist friends were consummate professionals once they got their heads down, and their attitude prompted new vigour and attention to detail in Kokoa, Jara, Stedman and the rest of the heads of departments. He had a feeling the effect wasn't what Hale had meant, however, and he was waiting for the other shoe to drop. In the meantime, he was enjoying the better working environment. He was particularly enjoying the presence of Camilla Lebedev. He'd made a habit of visiting her and Anders in their respective laboratories every day, learning about their disciplines and their ideas on how to solve the potential problems colonists might encounter on their new planet. 
Camilla was trying to develop a drug that would suppress the human immune response to external stimuli, but not affect the body's ability to detect and destroy anomalous cells of its own, that is, cancerous cells. Many treatments already existed, but she was working on one that could be easily synthesised from common, readily available substances. Anders' work was more innovative. He was trying to create a protocell, a cell containing the basic components for self-sustaining life that could be engineered into any number of different life forms. If the conditions on the colony planet were not suitable for farming any earth plant or animal species, the protocell could be programmed to survive and reproduce in the existing conditions, perhaps as an algae, cereal crop or even livestock. Because it wasn't native to the new world, the new life form would also be unlikely to provoke an allergic reaction in humans. Though Anders' work was more interesting to Lorcan, he found Camilla more interesting as a person. He'd chided himself for his foolishness over and over again, but he couldn't shake the impression of her similarity to Grace. What was even more affecting was the fact she was around the same age his wife had been when she'd died. That had been decades ago, and now, in comparison to her, he was an old man. And yet... Penny for them, said Camilla pleasantly, peering at figures on a screen. I'm sorry, what? Lorcan replied, startled out of his reverie. He'd been hanging about in Camilla's lab for an hour or so, checking her latest results. He'd offered up his own blood and bone marrow for her to use, so he felt a personal involvement in her experiments. That was his excuse for being there anyway, and he was sticking to it. Penny for your thoughts, she said. Haven't you heard of that saying? Only a penny? I suppose that seems a fair price for what passes through my head these days. What? Don't put yourself down. I'm sure the musings of the founder of the Antarctic project must be worth a little more than that. Maybe a whole cred? He laughed. Then instant guilt swept over him. What was he thinking? There had been a time when he'd sworn he would never... Would you like to see something interesting? Camilla asked. I'd love to. I hope you don't find my presence intrusive. Oh no, it's nice to have some company. I heard there used to be a time when laboratories were filled with staff, all working together. But nowadays, so much of what I do is automated. It can get a little lonely. She took a step away from the upright interface and swept an arm toward it, inviting him to take a look. As you know, your samples demonstrated you're allergic to grass pollen and shellfish. Yes? Look at this. Camilla pointed at a column of figures. This is your immunoglobulin E response to those allergens. Now, compare those numbers to these. She pointed at a second column. The figures were all lower, including some zeros. You did it, said Lorcan. You created an immunosuppressive treatment. I did, she smiled. But don't get too excited. It isn't a groundbreaking achievement these days. I just swapped some of the rarer components for more widely available ones. I still have a lot of work to do. I have to replicate the results, test the treatment's safety, and then go on to develop it further. Then more testing. It'll be years before I'm finished. We have years, said Lorcan. I mean... I have. I mean, the project has. It'll be years before all the ships are ready. He was stumbling over his words, feeling like a fool. Lorcan, where are you? Iolani Hale was calming him. Excuse me, he said to Camilla before replying. I'm in Dr Lebedev's lab. What do you want? I want to speak to you. I'll be right there. 
What Hale hadn't considered was whether Lorcan wanted to speak to her, but it appeared she was on her way regardless. Was that Iolani? Camilla asked. Yes, she'll be here imminently. I thought you would be hearing from her soon. She's been looking into something that concerned her. Something to do with the ship? No, something... The lab door opened, and Hale stomped in like a diminutive, grounded, avenging angel. I found it, she announced. I finally found it. I knew your operation was dirty. I just didn't know how dirty. Can I use this? she asked Camilla, pointing at the interface. Go ahead. Lorcan braced himself for another onslaught of Hale's animosity. Was she ever going to let up on delivering her endless streams of hatred? He'd got the point already. That was why she was here, interfering in everything he was doing. She was searching for something. Look, whatever it is you think you have on me, he said, I suggest you check your sources carefully. You might not agree with my methods, but everything that occurs under the umbrella of the Antarctic Project is legal and above board. Hmm. Are you sure about that? Hale replied, her attention not leaving the screen. Damn it, where's it gone? Ah, here it is. Take a look at this, Ur Talman, and tell me how you sleep at night. The display showed a vid of young miners emerging from a mine in what looked like a tropical country. He looked more closely. The miners looked very young. Too young. His confidence withered. How do I know this isn't fake, he protested, or that it's even one of my mines? As he spoke, a sign came into view. Camboto Mine. Underneath the name was written, Subsidiary of the Antarctic Project. Child labour, Hale spat. You have children mining cobalt for you in dangerous, inhumane conditions. Kids slaving away, getting sick, dying or living with lifelong disabilities so you can fulfil your ambitions. What do you have to say to that, Ua Talman? A pause dragged out. He genuinely had no idea what had been going on at the Camboto mine. But he didn't try to offer up the excuse. It was no excuse. He should have known. You used to have children, didn't you? Hale asked. Stop! How would you feel if that's enough? What I don't understand is... You really are relentless, aren't you? he growled. She was speaking over him, saying, Why you even bother mining cobalt on Earth when there are asteroids rich in it and almost everything else you need? Why, Lorcan, why? He was already on his way to the door. He couldn't bear to hear another word. Chapter 22 they arrived at the Resistance hideout a couple of hours before dawn. The Prizelli hills were silent in the darkness. The sky was cloaked in thick clouds, from which a soft blanketing rain was falling. Arthur had brought them unerringly and confidently to the correct place. He'd begun recognising signs from several kilometres away, signs entirely invisible to write. To him, the rolling green hills and wooded valleys were attractively scenic, but looked much the same. He knew from the time he'd spent at the hideout that the fighters had adopted a nocturnal lifestyle, carrying out most of their activities at night, so he wasn't worried about surprising them while they were sleeping. What he was worried about was being mistaken for a crusader by the lookout and killed before anyone took the trouble to check. If only Talon were here, she could call out a few words of Welsh to the person stationed near the entrance and then they would be safe to approach, even though they didn't know that night's password. Talon could be here, only inside the hideout. I know what you're thinking, 
whispered Merlin. He was standing behind Wright in the lee of the hill opposite, where they'd halted. Wright's skin crawled at the alien's proximity. He took a step forward. I'll go first, with Arthur, Merlin continued. No. He didn't trust him in the slightest, and he had no idea what he might do if given free reign. Ellis was clearly important to him. According to Arthur, Merlin saw her as the king's second in command, or something like that. Or he could have other plans for her. Whatever his interest was, it wasn't to Talon's benefit. That Wright was sure of. The only interests important to the alien were his own. So he wasn't going to let Merlin get to her first, assuming she was there. Then what's your plan, Major? The problem was the EAC was looking for Talon, so he couldn't shout out to the lookout that he was from the Alliance and he wanted to speak to her. That would be exactly what a crusader would say. He could try telling the lookout who he was. He'd stayed at the hideout for a couple of days, but the person he'd had the most dealings with, Ang Harad, was dead. There was a chance he wouldn't be believed, and by talking he would alert the lookout to their presence. He didn't want to fall victim to some terrified, trigger-happy youngster on duty for the first time. My plan is that you and Arthur wait here. He would have to sneak up and disarm the man or woman. Then he could provide convincing reassurances without the risk of having his head blown off. Dropping his pack to the ground, he stepped onto the track and began to return the way they'd come. He would have to leave the track and approach the hideout hill from the opposite direction to come at the lookout from behind. Fifteen minutes later, after toiling over the rough stones of the hills, he was finally in position. The lookout was hiding in a cleft between two large upright sandstone outcrops, the interior was entirely in shadow and just large enough for one person to sit comfortably. The spot commanded a wide view of the area before the hideout. No one could get within 50 metres of it without the lookout radioing a warning to those inside, then shooting to kill. Wright crept forward, skirting the edge of one of the massive rocks. The rain had begun to come down hard, turning the slope into a wide, shallow stream. Just as he was about to spring around the front of the boulder and leap on the person inside, he slipped on water-loosened scree and his legs went out from under him. Rather than grabbing and restraining the lookout, he found himself sprawling at his feet. Wait, he yelled, lifting his hands. I'm not a crusader, I'm from the Alliance. But the man either didn't hear, didn't understand Wright's English, or wasn't listening. He attacked. Wright deflected the blade aimed at his throat and grabbed the man's wrist. They were sliding down the slope, grappling in the loose shale. The lookout was on top of him. He fought to turn the man over, dodging the jabs of the knife that were coming at him, despite his hold on the other's wrist. He couldn't kill him, not even in self-defence. That would go down among the resistance like one of the stone slabs that dotted the hills hereabout. He had to get him to stop fighting long enough to listen. The way the fight was going, however, Wright would count himself lucky to simply survive. The knife plunged into the ground next to his head and stuck. As the man struggled to free it, Wright slid out from under him. He yelled again, I'm Alliance! Alliance! Wrenching out the blade, the lookout swung at him. Wright ducked. A dark figure appeared in the darkness, looming tall. Two large arms wrapped around the lookout, pinning his own to his sides, and lifted him until his feet left the ground. The man began to yell in Welsh, no doubt trying to warn the resistance members inside the hideout. It's OK, Wright tried to reassure him. Do you understand English? I'm Major Wright from the Britannic Alliance. I was here a few months ago. It was no use. 
the man continued yelling. Within seconds, fighters were pouring out. Some were carrying pulse rifles. Stay where you are, TJ, said Arthur. He stood between Wright and the hideout exit. As he spoke, a pulse round hit his back. He didn't react. The energy washed over him like a wave splashing over a rock. Wright gaped. Ellis had told him Arthur was impervious to pulses, but he hadn't quite believed it. All his adult life he'd witnessed the devastating effects of the rounds and suffered them too. Seeing Arthur unaffected by the bolt of energy was like seeing the sun rise in the west. Above the shouts and yells came the sound of Merlin calling out. The reaction of the fighters stopped almost as soon as it had started. The lookout relaxed in Arthur's arms and tried to peer around him to see what was going on. Someone replied to Merlin, who was walking toward the group from the opposite hill. They understood him. He could speak Welsh, like Talon. Of course he could. He'd also spoken English the moment he stepped aboard the Fearless. The alien hadn't needed the speed-learning software Arthur had used. He knew English, Welsh, and probably every other language spoken on Earth, probably every language that had ever been spoken on the planet. Arthur put the lookout down. The man was clearly no longer in any danger. He reached out to take Wright's hand and shook it, saying, Sorry. No, I'm sorry for surprising you. I was trying to. But the man was already leaving them, going to join the group at the hideout entrance. Merlin beckoned. When Wright and Arthur joined him, he said, They want us to go inside quickly, in case there are any crusaders nearby. The hideout hadn't changed at all from how Wright remembered it. Dark, dank, smelling of unwashed clothes, the place was just as cramped and crowded. Another thing he noticed immediately was that Talon wasn't here. She would have come over to him and Arthur right away if she was. A few of the fighters were fluent in English, though the lookout was not at all. One of them translated for him when he said he was glad no one got hurt in their tussle. I'm glad too, Arthur replied. Merlin was predictably taking the lead, chattering away in the country's native tongue. Wright could only stand impotently by and await the outcome of the discussion. After a few minutes' talk, the alien turned to him and said, She was here. She went to find her children, but she'd been shot by crusaders. Shot? She made it back and they treated her. She's better now, but she's gone again. A small group left ten days ago and she went with them. They're on their way to Bryn Cechli D. And where's that? Innis Morn. Another place name Wright hadn't heard of and would struggle even to pronounce. Why are they going there? Bryn Cechli D is a very ancient, very sacred place. They want to fuck up a crusader festival. Exactly. The End This has been The Gallant, Star Legend Book 3, written and narrated by J.J. Green, with help from Welsh language consultant Mike Paddock. For more J.J. Green books, visit jjgreenauthor.com.